Welcome to my Rayman 3 fan remake devlog series. I invite you to join me as I talk about my journey of learning Unreal Engine and programming. I will go over how I made this blank scene turn into this. Come on, I'm kidding. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? I'll be showing the models I've made, C++ code, and blueprint code. All right, let's dive in. Hello, welcome to the first episode of this series, and I guess to the beginning of my channel. If you haven't seen the channel introduction yet, I recommend watching it. It's not necessary to understand what's going on in this video, but it gives you some kind of insight into why I started this whole project in the first place. Anyway, in this video, I want to go over some first steps I took when starting this project. So the first 3D models I made, the skybox and stuff like that. All right, let's roll the clips. So instead of working on this level as a whole, I want to start with this island first. That's because I'm still looking for the art style that I'm going for. And once I have this island in a pretty much ready state, it will act as a guide for all the other assets that I'm going to make for this level. I chose this island in particular because it has the grass texture and the rock texture which make up most of this level actually. It's pretty flat so it has a lot of opportunity to lay out some foliage which, I, which is going to also be a huge part of the level and it also has a little structure here in the middle. So it has more going for it than being just a little boring piece of terrain. Alright, let's hop into Unreal Engine. So I started with making a skybox by using the built-in BP Sky Sphere and tweak some settings to make it look like the skybox in the original game. So basically a dark sky with a pinkish horizon. Then I added a fog. For the lake, I just added a plane and gave it a mirror-like material by just cranking up the metallic to, to one and having it almost have no roughness. Very simple, but it's good enough for now. For anyone wondering why I didn't use the built-in Unreal Engine sky system, I just decided it doesn't fit the art style that I'm going for as this is pretty realistic in my opinion and I'm going for something much more stylized. So now I'm ready to start working on the island itself. I want to get hold of the original game models as they will speed up the process of making my own and help me with placement and scale in Unreal Engine. Luckily, somebody already ported all the game models into Unreal Engine. If you haven't heard of Lumen Engine, go check it out. Uh, so I took the scenes from Lumen Engine and imported them into Blender. So I took the island into ZBrush to have it as a base for sculpting. I guess that's done. The model has around 200 million points, so I'll reduce it to around 600k. And it's time to drop it into the Unreal. So here's how I want to make the material. Since this is a nanite mesh, I have a much more vertices than I would normally have. And that means that I can bake in the curvature and cavity information into the model itself through vertex color. So let me show you what I mean in ZBrush. Here I have the regular model and when I turn on vertex color, uh, you see it looks something like this. Everything that's black, I want it to have a regular tileable rocky texture that I will make later on. The red parts will be edge highlights so it will be the rocky texture but brighter and the same for green except darker because they're going to be the cavities and the blue parts will simply be a mossy texture. For the rocky texture I first sculpted the normal map in ZBrush and then painted the rest in Substance Painter. I did the same for the mossy texture. After connecting everything in the material editor here's what I got. I think the vertex painting I done to highlight the edges and cavities do a lot of the heavy lifting since when I turn them off. In my opinion, it just makes the rock look much more flat and much more generic. I also gave some more controls in my material instance, like the texture size. I can change the global roughness if I want. I can give a tint to the rock. Um, I can change the contrast of my cavities, uh, actually my edges. 
can change the color of just the cavities or change the roughness of just my cavities or edges. Uh, I also opted for triplanar mapping. It makes sense for environment pieces that don't move and also I don't have to unwrap these nanite meshes which is a big pain. By the way, Unreal Engine already has a node that handles triplanar mapping, so there wasn't much work with that. It's called World Aligned Texture. You can easily change the texture size as well as change the transition contrast, so how the different planes blend together. There's also a triplanar node for normal maps called World Aligned Normal. Moving on to the door in the middle of the island, I imported the original model as a base and started sculpting again. Alright, now I needed to make the tileable textures for the well, tiles on the sides. I again made a normal map in ZBrush and finished it all off in Substance Painter. Once I had my tiles, I moved on to the boulder in the middle. Because of the painting of the fairy council, I decided to make a dedicated texture for this one. And there we have it, our beautiful door. The material for the tiles is very simple. The tiles are UV based, but I added a dirt overlay that is triplanar just to help me add some visual breakup or avoid repetition. Okay, next step, foliage. So I sculpted all the leaves in ZBrush and combined them into actual plants in Blender. I did optimize the leaves a little bit, but not too much because I'm going to use Nanite for the foliage as well. Then to finish it all off, I put all the leaves on one UV map and painted them all in Painter. And this is how it looks. For anyone wondering, that was 20 different plants. In the material graph, for the shading model, I'm using a two-sided foliage so the leaves can have translucency. So for the wind, I use a sine function to move the leaves left and right while using a cosine function to move them up and down. I use vertex painting for masking again. Anything that's black doesn't get affected by the wind at all. Everything in red moves left and right while everything in green moves up and down. Then I painted every leaf with a different alpha value so I can offset the movement per leaf so they don't all move the same way in like in unison. Then I added a global noise and a panner to move it around so the strength of the wind is random at any given moment. Here I kind of visualized for you the global noise movement on the foliage. I hope you can see how this panner is sliding this texture around. So basically the brighter the color is, the stronger the wind movement is for the plants that are located at, at those bright spots. So now if I plug in the color back in, you can see how over time the wind intensity changes. So I painted the island with foliage and here's the effects. As you can see, I updated the rock shader a little bit. I added a dirt texture that I can paint in using the vertex alpha channel. Let's enjoy some nature together. So episode two. In this one, I'm gonna go over how I tried to make Rayman's basic movement. So running, jumping, gliding, and hanging onto edges. Let's dive in. Okay, so let's first analyze Rayman's movement, as this will kind of show us what our goals are. The movement is very snappy. There's pretty much no deceleration when I let go of the movement keys. Also, in jumping, while jumping, Rayman can freely change the jump direction, so it's kind of like there's no momentum that's there from the jump. It's just, just the player's input. 
also running has this interesting behavior where when I hold the forward key, it, everything seems normal, but when I start running to the side, Raymond doesn't actually run sideways, he starts running around the camera. It's kind of like holding the left or right key causes Raymond to rotate perpendicular to the camera and then start moving forward. Or, yeah. Same with moving backwards. He first rotates to face the camera and then starts moving forward in his local forward axis, if you know what I mean. This system has this kind of funny effect where you can actually run sideways by just hitting the back and forth keys. I tried fiddling with the built-in Unreal Engine movement controller for a little while, but since it's force-based, so it has stuff like friction and acceleration, I wasn't able to replicate the snappy Rayman movement that we all remember from the original game. That's why I tried to make my own movement controller, because it was important for me to not make this feel like another Unreal Engine 5 game with just the Rayman skin on it. I wanted to actually feel like the original game, but with better graphics. So to start off, I made a new C++ class for the player character. Let me explain why I'm using C++ here. As I was learning Unreal Engine, at this point I finished this course on Udemy where they do pretty much everything in C++. If C++ isn't your jam, however, don't worry, neither is it mine. As the project went on, I found myself using more and more blueprints and less less C++. So in the videos to come, you're definitely going to see more blueprint related stuff. It's just that I find blueprints very intuitive and easy to use. As someone who doesn't have a programming background, trying to write stuff in C++ was... It's just difficult and I find myself spending way too much time in the Unreal documentation, not really understanding much anyway, so... I will assume that most people are interested more in blueprints, so for the C++ stuff I will go over all the logic that I've made, but I will not go too in-depth in the code itself. If I'm wrong here, please leave a comment and I will maybe make some more follow-up videos on the stuff that I have in my code, but for now this is how we're gonna do it. Coming back from that little tangent, I chose a pawn class as my parent class. As it's written here, this is pretty much what you want whenever you want to make something that can be controlled by the player. There's also the character class, but as I said, I want to make it pretty much from scratch, so I want something more basic. So here in code, I start by initializing a couple necessary components that I'm going to need for my player class, and that's the capsule component for handling collision and movement, the skeletal mesh component for actually for the actual player model, and a player camera. Don't worry about the movement component and the health component, I'll come back to those later. So then I made a blueprint class out of my C++ class, set the skeletal mesh component to a Rayman model, tweaked the capsule component size a little bit, and changed the player camera location. The Rayman model you see on screen is a model made by me, I will go over making it in a future video, but the animations are ripped straight from the original game. On the Rayman Pirate community forums, somebody posted Blender files with all the characters and their animations ripped from the original games, I think the animations hold up really well, they're very cartoonish, so I decided not to remake them as that would take a lot of time and I don't even think I would make a better job. So the next step was to set up player input. I have dipped my toes before in Unreal Engine 4 input mapping, but Unreal Engine 5 has this new thing called enhanced input mapping and to be honest I don't really get it. It's probably just my smooth brain but setting the whole thing up, especially in C++, is just way too complex for me and I will never be able to remember the whole process without referring to some kind of documentation or or checking a tutor video tutorial. But, but I digress, I eventually got it to work. So I started super simple from the beginning, just getting Raymond to move forward without any jumping, any gravity, any collision. And here's how I do it. My input, so whatever comes in whenever I press the arrow keys, is a 2D vector. The x-axis for the left and right arrow keys and the y-axis for the up and down arrow keys. So I take its length and set it as my input value. That's because I want Rayman to move forward no matter if I press the forward key, back key, left or right key or a combination of any of those. Because like we discussed earlier, his side movement comes from him rotating to the side we want to move and not him actually moving sideways. So now whenever I'm holding any of the directional keys, my input length will be 1, and whenever none of them are held, my input length will be 0. 
I'll explain this clamp in a moment. Then I set my run velocities x component that I created earlier to be equal to itself plus the input value times acceleration times delta time. Acceleration is a value that I can set in the Rayman blueprint to determine how fast Rayman will accelerate. And delta time is the time between frames in milliseconds. This is necessary so the movement is frame independent, otherwise Rayman would walk faster if you played at 60 fps compared to for example 30 fps. And then I clamp my run velocity to a max speed so the acceleration doesn't speed Rayman up indefinitely. Here at the end I'm multiplying this whole thing times input value. I'm doing this so whenever I let go of the directional keys Rayman will stop and not keep moving. Because if none of the directional keys are held then input value is equal zero so run velocity will also become zero. Now let me get back to why I clamp the input length. So the minimal value of 0.75 is there because I scale Rayman's run animation with his speed. So if the speed is very slow, the animation looks a little wonky. And it also actually feels a little better to play if your walk speed is easier to keep consistent. Now for the upper limit of one, that's there because I actually lied to you a little bit. The input value length isn't always one or zero. If you hold two keys at once, like for example the forward key and the right key, then the vector length is actually larger than one. So holding a combination of these keys would let you accelerate faster than if you just held the forward key. So this clamp fixes that little thing. Okay, so this is it for making Raymond move forward. And then I wanted to figure out that running behavior that we discussed in the beginning of the video where when I hold the re right or left key, he's going to run around the camera, and when I hold the back key, he's going to run towards the camera. This is where I decided that I'm going to make a different actor that's not parented to Raymond in any way, that's going to kind of act like a cameraman following Raymond around. However, I want to cover the camera stuff in the next video, so stay tuned. So here's how I solve rotating Rayman in relation to the camera's rotation. So I make a new 2D vector, 0, 1, and I call it my input forward vector. This is the same vector that I would get if I held just the forward key. Now by using a dot product between said forward vector and the vector created from the keys that I'm actually holding, like holding for example the right key, will give me a value between 1 and minus 1. In case you don't know, the dot, dot product between two perfectly aligned vectors is 1, between two perpendicular vectors is zero, and between two vectors that are aligned but go the opposite directions is minus one. And then we have everything in between, basically. So coming back to our example, if I'm holding the right key, the dot product between the input forward vector and the vector created by holding the right key will be zero, because those vectors are perpendicular to each other. Then I can use an invert cosine and a radians to degrees function to convert the value that I got from my dot product to an angle value. So now, Holding the forward key will give me a value of 0 degrees, holding the right or left key will give me a value of 90 degrees, and holding the back key will give me a value of 180 degrees. So now it's just a matter of setting Rayman's rotation to the camera's rotation plus our input angle value. In case that's still a little confusing, let me put it this way. If you want to run forward, then I want Rayman's rotation to match the camera's rotation. Holding the forward key gives me an input angle value of zero, which is perfect, because now this formula just sets Rayman's rotation to the camera's rotation. If I want to run to the side, I want Rayman's rotation to be perpendicular to the camera's rotation, so I need to add 90 degrees to the camera's rotation and set that as Rayman's rotation. Like we saw, holding the right key does just that. And then the same for running backwards. We need Rayman to face the opposite direction to the camera, so we need to add 180 degrees to the camera's rotation. I would like to remind that this works only because the camera is not parented to Rayman. Now, since I only get positive angle values, holding both the left or right key will make Rayman run to the right. To fix this, I multiply the input angle value by minus 1 whenever I'm holding the left key. So now holding the left key gives me negative 90 degrees and Rayman starts running to the left. Finally, I need to use a lerp to rotate Rayman because otherwise he's just going to snap to the desired rotation and I need him to rotate smoothly. For anyone that doesn't know, LERP stands for Linear Interpolation. And there we have it. When I hold the left key, Rayman walks around the camera to the left. And when I hold the right key, he moves to the right. All the way around. 
I can even move to the side by pressing the back and forth keys. So the next thing I want to make is falling and snapping to the ground. As I want Rayman to be pushed down by gravity at all times when he's not on the ground, I will first create a state called is falling. The reason for not wanting gravity to work when Rayman is grounded is that I'm afraid it will make him slide around when he's on steep angles. So the gravity is just a downward vector that moves Rayman every frame at an increased rate until it reaches some kind of max value. For the ground snapping I use the sphere cast. The way this works is the sphere shape is traced from Rayman's location to a location not too far beneath his feet. And if the trace detects colliding with something that means that Rayman should be considered grounded. If that is the case then gravity is no longer applied and instead Rayman's location Z component is set to the location of the sphere trace impact. In other words, he gets snapped to the ground. In actuality, I'm using two sphere casts of different priority. One that goes from Rayman's center and one that goes from Rayman's back. First the middle one is checked and if it returns an impact, then the other one is pretty much ignored. But if the first one does not return any impact, then we check the second one just in case. I do this so that Rayman has a bit of leeway before falling off an edge. This is also where I determine what's the maximum surface angle on which Rayman can walk. The Z component of a normal vector from a flat plane is 1, and the steeper we go, the less and less that value is until it reaches minus 1 for when the plane is a ceiling. So if the impact normal Z component is less than, for example, 0.75, then I can make Rayman still not considered grounded, which will make him continue falling. While we're at it, let me quickly add in gliding. The way I did this is just by decreasing the max gravity value while we're holding the, gr the glide button. Okay, sweet. Now, before we move on to collision, the only thing left is jumping. So the way I do it is first I move Rayman up just a little bit so the sphere cast stop considering him grounded. And then I set the starting gravity value to a positive, positive value instead of zero. So Instead of moving right away downwards, first Rayman moves up a little while until the gravity value hits zero and starts going into the negatives, making him start falling again. Now there's one more thing. All the cool platformers out there have this thing called Coyote Time. I believe the term comes from Roadrunner. So Coyote Time basically is this half a second where you can still jump even though you technically walked off the edge already. It's something you don't really notice when it's there, but when it's not there, it feels really bad to jump. If you want to try this for yourself, try jumping off an edge in Halo 1 and then do the same thing in Halo 2. The difference is very noticeable. As for how I implemented coyote jumping, I first made the boolean variable which allows Rayman to coyote jump when it's true. Then I set, the, set up a timer which fires as soon as Rayman stops being grounded. And as soon as uh, set time passes, the boolean variable switches to false, not allowing Rayman to jump anymore. All right, let's see how this is working. I can walk off the edge and fall, awesome. I can jump, move around in the air while jumping. I can also glide. Cool. So now came the hardest part and that was collision. Making Raven stop in front of surfaces is pretty easy. You just use a ray cast, but that's not really how games do it, isn't it? Usually when you walk into a wall, you slide along it and this was really hard for me to figure out. A little too hard, in fact, at least at the time. I spent days working on Collision with very little progress until somehow, luckily, I found out that Unreal Engine has a built-in slide along surface function in the pawn movement controller. And as soon as I implemented it, I never had Rayman fall through any surface again. It works flawlessly. There's even a tutorial on the Unreal Engine documentation page on how to use it. Unfortunately, I think it's just C++, so I actually lucked out here that I decided to make this pawn in C++. I think this is the only place in my in the whole project where actually using C++ was more beneficial to me than not. Of course, I don't want to say that you shouldn't use C++ or it's bad or something. I just want to say that I'm bad at C++. So coming back to the beginning of the video, that's why I have a movement component here in my constructor. And then here in the movement component, I have the slide along surface function that Unreal gave me. Since there's already a detailed tutorial on the Unreal Engine documentation page, I'm not gonna talk about this too much. The gist of it is that you need to feed in where you want your pawn to be this frame. This I already have calculated thanks to all of the movement code that I went through in this video. 
and then this function checks if from your location to your desired location is any collision and if there is some kind of collision it calculates the slide vectors okay i think connecting some animations to this whole thing will make it look really nice now i won't go over the animation blueprint in this video yet because this is the most complex animation blueprint in the whole project so i would rather start with something simpler therefore if you're interested in the animation blueprint stuff you need to wait until i get to the ninja crab enemy in the near future now Rayman actually has one more non-combat related ability that we haven't talked about and that's holding onto edges. So let's go over that. So first I use a line trace to find the climbable edge. I made a new game trace channel to have control over whether an edge should be climbable or not. Because this way if I set the collision for this channel to be ignored then this line trace won't detect that edge. If this line trace found the climbable edge, I check if Rayman is falling and I check if the normal of the edge is flat enough for Rayman to grab. If this is true, I set Rayman to a holding edge state. And if he is holding an edge, first I set his location to the impact points Z component so he's at the right height. And then I set the Z velocity to zero so he's no longer pulled down by gravity. And then I use another trace this one is here to rotate Rayman to be facing the edge he grabbed. Because otherwise he would just stop in the air but he wouldn't actually look like he's grabbing that edge. And here we have it working. In the future I would like to add some kind of tracing for the individual hands so they stick to the surface better. But for now this is good enough. Awesome, I think this is feeling really nice right now. There are two bugs that I would like to fix in this video before we finish off. The first one is when Rayman hits a ceiling when jumping, he doesn't actually bounce off it. He just sticks underneath it until gravity kicks in and starts pulling him down. And the second one it considers gliding. Look what happens when I start gliding on a steep edge. It turns out I'm able to move upwards, which I don't want, of course. I handle both of these bugs mostly in the player movement component. For the bug where I hit the ceiling, if there was some kind of collision detected in the movement component, I take the impact normal Z component to check how steep the plane was. Like I said earlier, a flat ceiling plane will have the, its impact normal Z component equal to minus one. So if the impact normal Z component is anywhere near that, I set Rayman's Z velocity to zero. So gravity starts pulling him down right away. Now for the gliding bug, that happens because on these steep planes the gravity vector is smaller than the slide vector that I get from the slide along surface function so he can travel upwards so what I do is again I get the impact normal z component of the collision and I use it as a scalar for the max gliding velocity so what this does is let's say my max gliding velocity is for example 20 once I start gliding into a wall I increase my max gliding velocity accordingly to kind of compensate for the sliding collision that's pulling me upwards. So as I'm flying into a wall, my gliding velocity will, will no longer be 20, but suddenly it'll be, for example, something around 30 or 40 or whatever it has to be. So I don't start flying upwards, but I keep falling down at a steady rate. Okay, as you can see, if I hit the ceiling, I start falling right away and I also can't glide up. Hi, in this one I want to talk about the player camera. So let's head to the original game and try to figure out what's happening over there. So like we said in the previous video, when Rayman runs, the camera kind of just follows him, doesn't actually rotate with him. It just keeps looking at him while it's, it's following him. For jumping behavior, when Rayman jumps, the camera kind of does nothing. It doesn't look up at Rayman, it doesn't move up with Rayman. It actually seems to just update its height when Rayman is grounded. So when I land on the next platform, that's when it starts moving upwards. An exception from that rule is when Rayman is launched by something. So when I walk on this bug, the camera moves up with Rayman. There are also these spots where the camera kind of moves to a set position and starts looking at Rayman from that place. Also when Rayman is hidden behind some kind of object, the camera starts rotating to find him. Just like over here. I'll do it again. 
And that's pretty much it for the camera for now. Let me hop into Unreal and show you how I went about doing all of this. So I made another C++ class for the cameraman. I made it a pawn again because I need the camera to handle collision as well. And I'm going to use the same collide and slide function that I'm using for Rayman. So here in the constructor, I just have a sphere collider for the collision and a camera movement component for the collide and slide function. There is no camera here because I'm copying this actor's location and pasting it to the player camera's location that's in the player pawn. But in hindsight, I think it would be a better idea to actually add a camera here and just set the player's view to this camera. So first let's cover the camera's behavior when Rayman is grounded. So the way I want to do this is to have the camera looking at Rayman at all times and then just moving back and forth in its local forward vector to maintain a steady distance from Rayman. I do that by finding a look at player vector by subtracting the player's location from the camera's location and then setting the camera's rotation to the look at player vector's rotation. To be precise, I change the camera's yaw rotation because that's the axis that makes the camera look to the right or left. I also made it where if the look at player vector rotation pitch is larger than some kind of value, I set the camera's rotation pitch to also match that. Pitch is the axis that moves up and down. I have this set up this way so the camera starts looking down at Rayman only when he starts getting out of view and not all the time. I don't change the camera roll because, well, I don't want it to be doing one of these. And now maintaining the camera's distance from the player is just a matter of taking the player's location and subtracting from it the camera's forward vector. However, the forward vector is just one centimeter long and we want the camera to be further away from the player than one centimeter. So we have to multiply the forward vector by some kind of amount, like for example, 500 centimeters to make it be five meters behind the player. And for the camera height, I just add a set amount to the player's Z component. All these variables are settable in the blueprint so I can play around with them easily until I find values that I like. I put the whole formula in the lerp to smoothen the camera movement. Finally, to make sure the camera updates its height only when the player is grounded, I put the whole thing in an if statement. If he's not grounded, I still update the camera's location in the X and Y axis, but I keep the Z axis unchanged. So now it updates the camera's height only when Rayman is grounded, like we saw in the original. Okay, so we got the camera going. It keeps its distance from Rayman, looks at him at all times. When Rayman jumps, it doesn't move up. It just updates its height when Rayman lands. Okay, let's go over how I made the camera to rotate around obstruction. So the way I see this is I need to make the camera start rotating around Rayman when he is no longer in view. And I need to find a way to make the camera know when it should start rotating clockwise and when anti-clockwise. So it doesn't get stuck on some kind of wall or something. To check if Rayman is still in the camera's view, I simply use the sphere trace from the camera's location to Rayman's location. And if it hits anything else than Rayman, then I know that Rayman is not visible and I need to start doing something about it. Now here's what I'm thinking about deciding which way the camera should rotate once Rayman is no longer in view. Let's imagine Rayman walking into a tunnel. If he was facing left when he was entering the tunnel, I imagine it's a pretty safe bet to start moving the camera right and vice versa. To find which way Rayman is facing, I use a dot product again. The first vector in my dot product is the camera's right vector. And the second one is Rayman's forward vector. So if Rayman's forward vector is somewhat aligned with camera's right vector, then the dot product is going to be bigger than zero. If Rayman is facing left, however, then the dot product will go into the negatives. So here in this formula, I start moving the camera right when Rayman is no longer in view, but I multiply it by the dot product sign. So if the sign of the dot product is minus one, then the camera will start moving left. Okay, let's check it out. I move from the right and the camera falls left. But if I move the other way, the camera start rotating to the right. Awesome. So that's pretty much all I have as far as C++ goes. Honestly, I'm not entirely happy with the camera yet. It can get jittery at times or get stuck on geometry. So in the future, I would like to either spend some more time refining this or rethink my approach entirely and maybe try to figure out some kind of a different, better solution. Anyway, let's talk about some blueprints I created that give me some more control over how the camera behaves. So the first one is a trigger box that can override the default camera distance or camera height 
while Rayman is inside the box. So it will be something like this. Let's increase this, for example. So something like this. I walk inside and it changes. I walk outside, it goes back to normal. Now the other thing this thing can do is it has this little camera over here that I can move. So for example, let's move it to look from the door over here. And now if I check this setting, uh, override location, then once I hit play, once I walk in the trigger box, it moves the camera to be in that place that I set it. And once I walk out, it follows Raymond again. So it kind of handles this behavior where the camera can move to a set location and watch Raymond from that point. So let's go over how I made the blueprint and we'll start with the viewport. The blueprint is made out of a collision component that's here to check whether Rayman is inside or not. The sprite component is just for my sanity so it's easier for me to find in the, on the map. The same with the arrow. Uh, and then I have an override location component which basically acts as a point that the camera is going to move to. And the debug camera is here just so I can see what's the view from that point. So it's here just for my convenience when laying out the trigger boxes. Let's check out the blueprint graph to go over how this works. So in the begin play event, which gets called whenever the trigger box gets spawned, I store the camera's default distance from Rayman, the default camera height and default lerp speed in some variables. I do this so I can revert the changes back to normal whenever Rayman exits the trigger box. So then we have our on component begin overlap event, which gets triggered whenever an actor overlaps with this trigger box. I get the player pawn and check if the actor that entered this trigger box is equal to the player pawn. I do this to make sure that all the logic happens only when Rayman enters the trigger box and not any other actor. So if this is true, we check if the override location setting is true or not. If it's false, that's when we want the that's when we want our trigger box to just change some default camera settings. So we change the camera distance to the camera distance we set in this trigger box, and we change the camera height to the camera height we set in this trigger box. And the same with the lerp speed. I also added a key player pitch variable to the camera pawn so I can decide whether I want the camera to look up and down or not. And here I can change that also in this trigger box. Now let's imagine that override location is set to true. That's when I take the override location components world location and copy it onto the player camera. I'll just quickly remind that the override location component is this little thing over here. And then so I don't have to copy the camera location for every frame, I added a variable in the player camera it's called location override that if it's true, the camera no longer follows Rayman and instead it stays at the location set by the location override component until we set this variable back to false. And then I have the on component end overlap event that gets called whenever Rayman exits the trigger box to put all the settings back to normal. I also have a second type of trigger box where whenever Rayman enters, the camera will follow Rayman but it will also move along a predetermined spline. So let's go over this one now. We also have a collision component for to detect when Rayman enters or not. And also a key factor is this spline variable that's instance editable, editable. This allows me to connect the spline from the level to this trigger box. So here most of the logic happens in event tick. Let's ignore this branch for now. So every frame I'm overriding the player camera's location with the closest point on the spline to the player location. However, I don't want the camera to find the closest possible location to the player because I want there to be some distance between the player and the camera. So I do this basically the same way I do it in code. So I find the player's location and I subtract from the player's location the camera's forward vector multiplied by some kind of distance. So now the camera maintains its distance from the player the same way it does when it's not moving along its spline. Now I have this branch here because the tick event, well, it doesn't care if Rayman is inside the trigger box or not. So this logic will happen regardless of that. So that's why I have this activate variable, which becomes true whenever Rayman overlaps with the trigger box. 
and of course becomes false when Rayman exits the trigger box. So now all this tick logic happens only for as long as Rayman is inside of the trigger box. Episode 4. I'm pretty excited about this one. Today I'm going to go over making the whole fairy council area, at least the environment part. Let's hop in. All right, since we already have that main island that we made in the first episode, let's start this whole thing by making the other ones. I'll do a little turnaround. Here we have two rocks because these are basically the boulders that are underneath the wooden bridge. And then I put them into Unreal Engine the same way I did with the first island in the first episode. So I start with vertex painting and ZBrush and then just put the material that I made in the first episode. Next I decided to make the terrain that I'm standing on right now and the island's terrain that the tower is located on. So as always I imported the original mesh into ZBrush. I added some more triangles so I can smooth it out nicely and added some lumps here and there to kind of give it more of a terrainy feel. The same goes for the tower island in the middle. Okay I dropped the terrain into Unreal. Use the same principle of using vertex paint to determine where I want rocks and, and other stuff like that. As you can see, this is very smooth, very PS2 graphics right here. And to fix this, I would just, I would like to create some rocks and just start jamming them into these smooth walls, something like this. So let's start making some rocks. There are a couple rock shapes that repeat throughout the level, like these or these or these, or a long one like, like this one. So I'll basically do the same. For anyone interested, here are the brushes I usually use when sculpting stuff like rocks or wood. Clay buildup, clay tubes, trim dynamic, orb cracks, edge polish, mallet fast. The same goes for some old stylized metal, except I add in some dents using the standard brush. And so that's one, two, three, and four. And as always, we finish him off with some vertex painting. So I took one of those rocks and did the wall jamming. However, this intersection where the rock connects with the terrain is really ugly. So I scoured the YouTubes for some blending techniques and found out that Unreal Engine has this thing called Runtime Virtual Textures. And it basically solves my problem here. Here's a tutorial I use for anyone that also wants to implement this technique. All right, check out this magic. Runtime virtual textures off and now on. Cool. So here's what I got after placing some more rocks. I got some on the main island over there. Put some on the walls over here and near the water and started laying out the rocks on the edges of the map and in the background. So while we're still on the topic of rocks, as the moon is just a background piece, all I did here was find one crater alpha online and just go crazy with it. To be honest, I didn't even make a material for the for these. They're purely white and the greenish tint comes just from a light source. Okay, now I'm thinking about moving on to the wood material. So for the models, I got some planks to build a bridge over here. I also need to make these wooden poles that have this kind of golden thread on it. 
And these barricades are also going to be made of the same planks, so this is not an additional model. Yeah, so I guess it's just wooden planks and wooden poles. In every wooden plank, I made the backside without the swirlies to give me a little more control when level building where I want the swirlies and where I don't want them. And here's the wooden pole. I did, however, do the final touches in Blender. I wanted to add these loose threads sticking out and doing that is just easier for me in Blender. For the table texture, I decided to go for this kind of desaturated smooth wood grain. It seems to me to most closely resemble what was intended in the original game. So here in Unreal, wood uses the exact same material setup as the rocks. It just has a different texture set put in. For the golden thread that's on the wooden poles, since it's such a small part of the model, I just connected the gold material that comes with the Unreal Engine starter content. Okay, I think it's time to make something big. And by that, I mean the big ass tower that's usually in view over here. For the material, I used the same rock material as everywhere else, except I made a new instance and changed the tint and some of the texture scale. Since we're already in this area, I'd like to make the stairs now and this button holder, as well as the door to the ferry cancel. Maybe the lamp since it's connected to the door. Um, actually, if we're going to make the lamp, let's also make these windows that come out of the ferry cancel. Okay, so you probably know the drill by now. Sculpt and ZBrush, drop it in Unreal. This one uses the same materials as the structure that we made in the first episode. So rocks and the tiles. You can even see the runtime virtual textures doing some work here as the bottom of the stairs is nicely blended with the sand. Okay, next one. And the next. So the materials on the door frame are nothing we haven't seen before. We have the rocks, tiles, and wood. However, the door itself has some new stuff. The metal is another tileable texture I made that uses the same material as the rocks and wood. And the door itself is a dedicated texture. So here's a tileable metal material. I decided to make it very dirty and messy to kind of reflect the crude technology that's in Rayman. And here's the door. These lamps are usually hanging from some kind of branch or root, so I made one of those too. This one also got its own dedicated texture. Okay, this is getting kind of cozy. For easy reusability, I combined the lamp model with the branch and a point light into a blueprint. Also, I made the lamp to not cast shadows because the point light is inside the lamp. For the window model, I just made the window frame because the window itself will be reused from the lamp texture. Just like that. I combined these windows with rectangular lights and gave them strong volumetric intensity to give it a nice gloomy feel. I'm actually still missing this button over here. I am no longer missing this button. I think there are two more models I'm missing at this point. One is the mushroom over here and the other one are these entrance trees. Whew. This one also got its own dedicated texture. I will be going more in depth into my texturing process, but I want to leave it for the Crab Ninja video because I think it just makes more sense to do it in a video that's dedicated to one model. And the Crab Ninja video will be the next video, so coming soon.
So I put the mushrooms on the level in clumps, even though they were singular in the original game. It just seems to make more sense. And I complemented them with some point lights to give them some stronger glow. I got some over here too. To brighten up this little dark corner. And I put one in the back over here. For the same reason, actually. So once I sculpted my tree in ZBrush, I dropped it into Blender to add in some leaves. The leaves use the same material as the foliage, I just added them to the atlas. And here they are in Unreal. As always, the runtime virtual textures do wonders. Also, I think this translucency looks really nice. Now, while we're on the topic of nature, I think it's high time we put in some foliage. So, I'll just clap my hands and... Let me do a little flyby. I'm not really a fan of how bright the background is right now. So I'm going to put him in shadow by dropping these huge planes in the sky. Now back in the original, uh, there are also these kind of foggy clouds in the background that I would like to add. So for the fog, I actually bought William Foucher's Easy Fog asset for Unreal Engine. They look really nice and are super easy to use. So I definitely recommend them to anyone and Overall, I really recommend his channel. He has great stuff. So here we have the easy fog in action. I think it blends really nicely and really actually fits the style. One more thing that might be hard to notice. I put a fog card that's like flat on the ground over here. If I turn it off, you might be able to see it. The like these IRS get much darker. And once I unhide it, they kind of brighten them up. So it's kind of supposed to simulate all this fog that's gathering like in the cavities. Okay, I think we're almost done with today's video. One last thing to cover are the particle systems, like the one on the button over here. Uh, another thing is the shooting stars that come down behind the moons. I would also like to add that. And one bonus particle system I would like is some kind of fireflies that gather around light sources like those lamps over there in the distance or the windows. So let's start with the button particle system. So for the texture, I have this flare texture that I found online. And for the particle system it itself, I think I'll just go from top to bottom. So they get initialized on a cylinder. Uh, here I have a color node where the alpha starts at zero and ends at zero. So they smoothly fade in and out of existence. And then for the swirling around, I use a vertex, a vortex force and the curl noise force to kind of give a little more randomness to the vortex force. And here they are in the scene. Okay, and for the fireflies, I made no changes to the sprite renderer. Uh, I initialized the particles on a sphere. I use scale here to kind of fade them in and out of existence so they don't just disappear a curl noise to give them some kind of erratic random movement and a point attraction force so they don't fly away and, and actually 
swirl around the light source. And here at the end I have a color force that gives him the emissive properties. I actually updated the lamp blueprints to contain the firefly effect in them. Okay, finally we have the shooting star. The star itself uses the same flare material that the button particles was using. And the trail behind the star is just a ribbon renderer that emits from the star particle. So here I have the spawn particles from other emitter. That's what solves that. Aside from that, I have a box slash plane that's like really big for the initialized locations. So they get spawned at pretty random places that are pretty far apart. I then add some velocity that goes to the right and a bit down. So they kind of get their initial velocity already, but then they also go down through a gravity force. How about we make a little recap of what I've made so far. So for the models, I got nine different boulders slash islands, four rocks, one moon model, eight kind of miscellaneous models. I would count. So I count the tower, the stairs, the door frame and a door to the tower or the glow box blocker kind of thingy, seven wood models, so six planks and one pole, uh, the lamp and the window model, Th actually 30 foliage pieces, so one tree, uh, one branch for the lamp, one mushroom model, and 27 different little plants that I use for painting foliage, and one terrain mesh, so that comes together to 62 different models. We also got three particle systems, for the materials that I made, I have six. Uh, one, the vertex paint curvature material uh, and our runtime virtual texture source material for the terrain. Uh, the tile material, the material that I use for dedicated textures, one foliage material and one particle material for the flare texture. Let's also count up the texture sets. I got four dedicated texture sets, one for the mushroom, one for the glow box blocker, uh, one for the door and one for the lamp. I have six tileable textures. So for the tiles, for the rock, dirt, moss, metal and wood, and one texture atlas for the leaves. Combining all that together, we have this little scene in front of us. Episode five, Crab Ninja. This one's gonna be a two parter. Today more of the graphic stuff and I'll leave the code stuff for the next one. Okay, but first let's check out the original so we all have an idea of what needs to be done. Okay, so for one, this guy faces me at all times. When he unsurfaces, he throws his stars and then goes back underground. So his attack consists of two star projectiles that arc, one to the right and one to the left. He seems to unsurface when I move out a certain distance from him. Although this seems a little annoying how he'll never come out if I wait for him. So maybe I'll just make a timer so he'll unburrow always after a set time. I can always easily change this to make him unburrow when I move away if I have to. Okay, I think we can get back to the remake now. So just like with the Raymond model, I have the original Crab Ninja model with all the animations over here. As you can see, the UV map is pretty messed up, but that's no problem. It's not like I was going to use it anyway. So as per usual, I took the base into ZBrush as a sculpting guide. I wish I had some kind of time lapse of making this thing, but well, I'm just have to going to go for the usual. The biggest change I think I made are those antennas, as I really don't know what those flaps in the original are. Let me move the camera a little bit here to show off the detail that I made. For the sculpting brushes, I pretty much use the same thing as for rock and wood and stuff, except I use a lot of the move brush when making characters. Sometimes I like to turn on AccuCurve for move brush when I want some kind of more pointy details. As for topology goes, I was very lazy here and just decimated my model to around 19k triangles. I know this isn't even close to being called good topology, but well, you know, this, this is not a main character and you'll never really see him up close in game. So there's just no way anyone will ever notice any bad deformation here. And taking into account that I'm doing this whole thing solo, I want to cut corners wherever I can. Let me fast forward a little bit and show you how the animations look on this 
bad topology model. In my opinion, there's really no way to tell there's something wrong here. If you're wondering why I'm suddenly doing retopology at all, that's because Nanite doesn't support um, skeletal meshes. So anything that you can move using a skeleton. Okay, so first I copied the vertex weights for the skeletal deformation from the original model to my model using a data transfer modifier. And then I laid out my UVs. I used Marmoset to bake out my maps from the high poly to low poly for texture painting. And then I paint the whole thing in Substance Painter. I'll go here kind of layer by layer to talk about my process for texturing stylized models like this. So I started with some kind of base color that's more for the inside of the crab than, than the shell itself. And then I add some variation to it, some kind of noise. I also introduced this yellow spots using the curvature. Then I add some kind of base color for the shell. And just with, like with the inner part, I start adding variation. So first I make some kind of yellow curvature. Then I start with some kind of noise, some orange spotty patterns. Then I added these kind of bright spots where I imagined the shell would scratch itself a lot against different surfaces. And then there's a layer for these darker spots. So I'm basically adding more color variation. And for the roughness, I kind of made this roughness base made out of just the pearl and noise. Let's go into the roughness channel. And then added the grunge to kind of sell this kind of wetness of a crab shell. I also added the layer that kind of emphasizes the cavities. For the eyes, again, a base color for the pupils and these, I painted in these veins to kind of make it more angry. And then I painted in the pupil highlight by hand. Also for the eyes, I add this kind of fake ambient occlusion using this kind of dark bluish color. Now for the shell, again, a base color. Then I kind of try to sell the shell translucency by adding this kind of salmon color on the edges and add in some color variation using some noise, a little dirt spots, and then kind of similarly for the roughness, first kind of a global noise and then some, and then a different one to mix them together. And for the outer shell, again, a base color, we can go back to the inner shell. Uh, I added this kind of darker color where these two parts meet. And then I wanted to make these kind of lines. So first I add these darker lines on the shell, then brighter ones, then white ones, and then a couple ones that go perpendicular to those lines. I made these lines by using an anisotropic noise, blurring them and blur warping. And again, a edge highlight. And then the roughness using grunge maps again. And then we have the star left, base color, edge highlights, some kind of noise to give it a little more realism, but not too much since I want to keep it stylized. Some more color variation and then roughness breakup. I usually like to add the ambient occlusion map on top to kind of push in the contrast, but not too much. And here we have him in Unreal Engine. I'm actually really happy with how he turned out. By the way, if anyone's wondering about LODs, I just let Unreal Engine generate them for me. I also imported the star by itself to act as a projectile for later. So I got the crab, but I don't have an enemy. Let's start by making a C++ class again. This time I chose the character class because it has these two built-in functions, line of sight and set focus, which can easily handle the crabs looking at player behavior. However, looking back at this, I think the character class is very much overkill here, as these two functionalities I could easily create even if in an actor class, not even a pawn class. But let's stick with the character class because I'm too lazy to change this. While I'm at it, I'll also make a C++ component that's going to be the health component. This way, whenever I need something to have health, I can just add this component to it in the blueprint and not make it from scratch every time. For now, all I need this health component to have is a max health value that I can set in the blueprint and a current health value. And in begin play, I just set the current health to be the max health. 
So in my crab enemy class, I'm going to have a projectile spawn component. That's going to be just a location for the projectile to spawn from and the health component we just made. I don't need to add a capsule component for collision and the skeletal mesh component for the mesh since this is already there in the character class. So I made a new blueprint from my crab enemy class and as you can see, it has all the components that come with the character class. So a character mesh, an arrow component and a capsule component and a character movement component. And here are also my components. So the health component and the projectile spawn component, which I placed somewhere over here in front of the crab. Also, if I select the health component, you can see that I can set the max health for the crab and the current health is grayed out as this is not editable as it shouldn't be. I also promised to go over the animation blueprint in this video, so I think we can do that now. So here we are in the animation blueprint now. And here's my state machine for the crab. If we go inside, I have this state that's way underground over here. And this is just the animation that's the crab being underground. Let's go back now. And then we have a transition from way underground to surface. So when I go into surface, basically this is a surface animation. This one over here. And the transition for this is a boolean, this player in range. This boolean doesn't do anything yet, of course, because it's not connected to anything, but we'll go over that later. Right now I just want to go over the logic itself. So whenever the player is going to be in range of the crab, this is going to become true. And he will transition from the waiting underground to the surface animation. And once the surface animation ends, this cycle over here starts. There is no transition rule. They just add, So this means that when this animation ends, it will go straight to this state machine over here. So let's dig inside. And this is a cycle that's going to happen whenever the crab unburrows, right? So first he enters his idle animation. Here I have an automatic rule again, so this means that once the idle animation finishes, he goes into his attack state. And the attack state is just the attack animation. And then when he finishes his attack animation, he will transition to, the, to another idle state, which is the same idle animation again. I just want him to do one more idle cycle once he finishes attack and then he starts to burrow again. So the cycle ends on him being underground and then we're gonna have this variable called ready to surface that will become true after a couple seconds of him being underground so it's basically a delay for him to be underground for a while and once this becomes true Again, if the player is in range, he will surface and start the whole cycle again. There are also these two states for when he dies and when he has taken damage. That will take him to the being hit animation. And the death animation. But since Raymond can't really do any damage yet, these are kind of here for show. Again, the for the transitions, here we have uh, is dead boolean that once it becomes true then he goes into the death state, ma state machine and same here once he has taken damage is true then the taking damage animation plays and from here we also can go to the death animation in case he for example gets hit twice while taking damage if he doesn't die however once the animation ends he goes back to his unburrowed cycle now to connect those variables that we have in the animation blueprint to actually do something we need similar variables on the blueprint or in C++, like over here, you can see a has died boolean or ready to surface boolean or here in C++, a is player in range boolean. Of course, we don't have any logic in our code to drive those variables yet. Let me make a little example so you can imagine what that would look like. I'll call the any damage event. Okay. So this gets called when the crab takes damage. I take my health component and get my current health. Now we subtract the damage from our current health. And we check 
if our health is less than zero. I'll make a branch now. And if that is the case, I'll set has died to true. So now all we need is for the animation blueprint to use this has died variable to determine whether we should play the has died animation or not. And then to set these variables in the animation blueprint, we need to go into the animation blueprints event graph. Here we can try to get the pawn owner, which means that the owner of this animation blueprint. So in our example, this is the crab. And then we need to cast to a BP crab. What this means is that we're kind of telling Unreal Engine that this pawn is a crab. And if we're right, then we can go ahead with the logic. And if we're wrong, we'll just get a cast failed. So when we, once we have our object as a BP crab, we can reference variables from the BP crab, for example, has died. We can use that to set the animation blueprints local is dead variable. And now the animation state machine will know that is dead is true. So it can go from the unborrowed cycle state to the death state. Okay, let's change the topic a little bit and talk about the star projectile. Okay, so I wanna make the star to be spinning around while it's flying at the player. And the best way to do this is in the shader. This is very easily done as there's a node in the shader editor that does this for me. It's called rotate about world axis cheap. To make this work, I plug in the Z axis into world position offset. So it rotates around the Z axis. And for the rotation amount, I plug in the time and multiply it by some kind of amount to make it rotate faster. One thing to know, when using this node, you also need to use the fixed rotate about axis normals node. Here you also plug in the rotation angle, the same one that I plug in my rotate about world axis cheap. And for the rotation axis, I choose the Z axis by making a vector with X and Y at zero and Z equal to one. I also added an option to mask the rotation through vertex color. I did this so the Crab Ninja can use the same material as the Starfish model. I don't really know if this is better performance wise or I should just make two materials. If anyone knows, you can let me know in the comments. Okay, now for some particles. So in the original game, when the Starfish gets destroyed, it spawns some kind of magical particle effect, but I think it would be cooler if it would actually spawn some kind of floating bubbles whenever it disappeared. So it matches the aesthetic of a more aquatic creature. On the Raymond Pirate community forums, I also got a hold of all the original textures from the game. And amongst those textures, I found a bubble texture that I liked and wanted to use for this particle effect. So first I made the bubble material for the particle effect. The texture itself is just the texture I found from the original game, but I also added some refraction in the back of the bubble. So it kind of gives it some more depth, I guess you could call it. And then for the particle effect, I use a spawn burst instantaneous. So they all spawn at once when the star gets destroyed. The shape location is just a little sphere. I scale the sprite size with their lifetime. Then I use the gravity force to move them upwards by setting the gravity to a positive value. And then I put a curl noise to give them a little more randomness. Also the lifetime of every bubble is random. For the projectile trail, I made a particle system that looks like this. By the way, shout out to UNF Games. That's where I learned the particle stuff that I'm using over here. They also give away for free all the textures that they use for their particle stuff and allow you to use them in your own projects. I definitely recommend to check them out. This particle system is made out of two trails, one for the refraction trail and one for the glowing trail. The systems themselves are very simple. I use a spawn per unit. That's why I had to move them around the scene so you could see it because this essentially means that it will spawn another particle whenever the particle system moves a set amount. And that's pretty much all there is for the particle system. So let's go into the materials. First, maybe the glowing one. So I take this kind of flamey glowing texture that I got from UNF Games and pan it around. And then I use this derived HDR from LDR node to kind of control how much the particle system glows. Here, if I change the glow strength, you can see the effect more. Let's change the 10 or 100. And that's pretty much it. And for the refraction material, 
it's maybe a little hard to see what it's doing, but I'm basically refracting the background through this kind of noise. And then I'm using these gradients to kind of make the refraction fade out to the sides. So it's the strongest in the middle. And the final thing I want to go over is this particle system whenever the crab burrows underground and or surfaces. So this system is made out of kind of three layers. One for the smoke that comes out, one more like dirt, and then these pebbles. The smoke and dirt work very similarly. I give them some kind of initial velocity. I make the sprites rotate around, give them some drag so they don't fly too far away. I scale their size over their lifetime so they kind of grow. And then I use a scale color to scale the alpha down to zero with their lifetime so they fade out nicely and not just disappear. Now for the pebbles, I give them a velocity from point. So from the center point, they fly outwards. I scale their size over lifetime so they kind of scale down to nothingness and not just disappear. Use a gravity force so they start falling after a while. I don't think this collision is really doing anything. I'll just delete this. And then I add a rotational velocity so they are more erratic. And to make them be actual meshes, I use a mesh renderer, choose a pebble mesh that I made in Blender. It's a very simple, low poly pebble shape. And give it some kind of brown material that I found, I think in the Unreal Engine starter content. For the smoke materials, let's go into the smoke particle material I made. So here I drive the opacity with one of the clouds I got from the Easy Fog asset. And then to give this kind of more interesting cloud-like movement, I offset this texture's UVs by a noise that's moving thanks to this panner. I also like to add this depth fade node. What this does is it kind of sets the opacity of the particle to zero near intersections with other meshes. So the intersections become much more natural. Let me show you this in action. So here I put the particle material on the plane. And when I intersect it with the rock, it looks very nice. And here's what it looks like when I disable depth fade. Yeah, so I think it's a big difference. The dirt material is actually much simpler. It just uses some kind of noise texture that I think I got from the Unreal Starter Pack. And I use a radial gra gradient to kind of mask out the edges. So it has more of a circular shape. I also use the depth fade here. Now to make this particle effect play during the animation, like over here, you just need to ne add a new Notify and notify play Niagara particle effect. And then once you choose it, you can choose the particle particle effect you want, attach it to some kind of bone. In my case, I attach it to the root bone. Okay, so let's make the crab look at the player at all times while he is in his line of sight or in a set range. So the line of sight and the set focus functions are functions on the AI controller I know I said that you need the character class and not the pawn class for this to work. To be honest, I'm not sure if that's true. It's just that I couldn't get it to work with the pawn class. It might be just my mistake. And again, if I'd be doing this now, I wouldn't even be using this line of sight and set focus at all. I would just find the player look at vector to rotate the crab and use some kind of sphere trace to check if he's in line of sight or not, just like we were doing with the camera. Okay, so in begin play, I get hold of the player pawn and of the AI controller of this crab enemy. I'm allowed to get a controller and then I cast it to an AI controller. This cast is doing the same thing it was doing in the animation blueprint. So it's taking some kind of controller and we're telling Unreal that this is an AI controller. Just make sure you actually have an AI controller plugged in into your pawn blueprint or character if you're using the character class. So now in tick, I check the line of sight of the AI controller to the player pawn to set focus on the player pawn. I also check if the player is less than 1,250 units from the crab ninja. I know I shouldn't hard code values like this, but I just never came back to fixing this. Okay, so if this if statement is true, the AI controller sets its focus on the player pawn, which makes the crab ninja rotate to face the player. And if it's not true, we just clear the focus. Great, so now once we run up to the Crab Ninja, 
he unburrows and keeps looking at Rayman. Now let's make the crab wait for one second while he's underground before he can surface again. So here in the BP crab blueprint, I created a custom event like this and named it surface delay. So once this event gets fired, I set a delay for one second. And once this delay is completed, I set the ready to surface variable to true. Now I use the burrow animation to fire off this custom event. Here at the end of the animation, I created a notify that gets fired whenever the animation reaches this frame. And this is what the notify does. It gets the owner of this animation, casts it to a BP crab and fires the surface delay event that we have here in our BP crab. Then in the animation blueprint event graph, we set the local ready to surface to be equal to the BP crabs ready to surface. And after that, I set the BP crabs ready to surface back to false. So the surface delay event can change it back to true whenever the animation notify fires. And now as we see here, the crab waits a little while and then it resurfaces. We can move on to spawning projectiles now. So first I make a C++ class for the projectile. This one is a child of an actor. And for the components, we need a collider that I use a sphere collider and a projectile mesh, which is a static mesh component. Now we can make this into a blueprint. For the, for the projectile mesh, we use our crab projectile. And I also added the trail we made in the previous video. So now the crab ninja has something he can actually spawn and I do it here in this fire projectile function. So we take the spawn projectile and spawn it at the projectile spawn component location. We need something that's gonna call this function now and I'm gonna do it through animation notifies again. So in my attack animation, I created two animation notifies, one over here and the other one over here that will call the fire projectile function. And this is how it looks. So all it does, it casts to the crab enemy so I can call his fire projectile function. Now we need to make the projectile functionality. So the projectile will travel from the crab's location to the player's location, but not in a straight line. It needs to curve around to Rayman. And here's how I want to handle this. First, I want to spawn the projectile rotated to be facing the player. So the forward vector points at the player location. Then as it's traveling to the player, I want to add an offset along the right vector. So I'm adding an offset up until the halfway point between the projectile's location and the player's location. That's when the projectile reaches the apex of the curve. And after the halfway point, I'm subtracting along the right vector so the, so the projectile moves back to hit its target. In other words, I'm just making the projectile move to its target along a half circle. So since we want it to move along a circle, we're gonna have to use either the sine function or the cosine function. The cosine function here works perfectly because it starts at one and goes to minus one. So the offset is gonna be the strongest in the beginning and the middle point is gonna come around to zero and then it's gonna go back to where it started. Okay, so first in begin play, we need to get the player's location and use it to find the player location vector. So we can set the projectile's rotation to make his forward vector be aligned with the vector pointing to the player. Now we need to calculate the distance for the projectile's starting location to the player's location. And then I normalize that distance to range between 0 and 180. This will make a little more sense in a moment. Now let's move to the calculate y offset function. This is the function I wrote to calculate the offset along the right vector of the projectile to make it move in an arc. So first I calculate the distance from the projectile's current location to the projectile's starting location. And then by multiplying this distance by the normalized player distance, we get a value between zero and 180. Let me explain this with an example. If the projectile is halfway to the player, then the distance from start is equal half to the player distance. Since the normalized player distance is 180 divided by player distance, this multiplication will give us a value of 90. And cosine of 90 is equal zero, so exactly what we need. However, this cosine function takes in radians, so I need to quickly convert this degree value to radians. But we're not done yet. We can't really use our projectile's current location to calculate its distance from its starting location. 
That's because our distance calculations are made as if the projectile was moving in a straight line, and this is not the case. So if the projectile is over here, for example, we need to calculate its distance from start as if it was over here. So in other words, we need to find the distance between the projectile's location and an imaginary line that's created between the projectile's starting location and Rayman. And if we subtract that distance from the projectile's right vector, we will get the projectile's location where it would have been if it wasn't moving along an arc. Okay, so now to find the projectile's distance to the imaginary line, I use the point distance to line function. Isn't that convenient? And now to calculate the projectile's distance from its starting location, instead of using the projectile's current location, I plug in the formula that we just mentioned. Okay, so now in tick, I have this if statement. If distance from start is less than the player distance, we add actor local offset. I use an add actor local offset, so the projectile movement is in its local orientation. In the projectile's forward direction, I just move it using a projectile speed variable. And in the projectile's right direction, I use the offset we got in our calculate y offset function. I multiply this by some kind of value because projectile y offset can be only between one and minus one. And then there's projectile direction. This is a value that I want to be only one or minus one. And that's because the crab, when he throws his stars, one arcs to the right and one arcs to, to the left. So by multiplying the projectile y offset by minus one, the star will be arcing the other way around. If the if statement returns false, however, so the distance from start becomes larger than the distance to the player, this projectile gets destroyed. Now, back in the crab enemy, I update the fire projectile to set the projectile direction when it gets spawned. This way the crab decides whether this projectile should arc to the right or to the left. I set this projectile direction in the animation notify. So in the animation notify crab left throw projectile, I set the projectile direction to one. And in the enemy notify crab right throw projectile, I set the projectile direction to minus one. And here he is in action. All that's left now is to have the projectile deal damage to whatever it hits. There is a built-in apply damage function that will call the any damage event on the other actor. So if the other actor has some functionality built into the take any damage event, then that functionality will get called once this apply damage function gets called. Making this in the blueprint would be just as simple as calling the apply damage in the on hit event. In C++, from what they taught me in that Udemy course I mentioned in the second episode, this is a little bit more complex. First in the constructor, you need to set up something called a dynamic multicast delegate or something like that and assign the on hit function to this delegate. So now if I understand this correctly, the on hit event will get fired whenever this projectile hits something. And here in the body of this on hit function, I wrote basically what I want to happen whenever this projectile hits something. I think what's worth going over here is this if statement. So if there is an actor hit, and the other actor is not the owner of this projectile, we apply damage. I also added the destroy at the end, so the projectile despawns what the, once it hits something. All right, let's set up Rayman to receive damage so we can check if this is working. So I'll add a receive damage event. We'll take the health component to check what Rayman's health is. We'll get the current health and subtract damage from the current health. And then we will set this as our new health value. And then we'll print out the value to see if this is working. And as we can see in the top left corner, when Rayman gets hit, the value decreases. While I'm on the topic of taking damage, let's do one more thing. I assume pretty much every actor that's going to be able to take damage will have some kind of health value and that health value will be decreased by the damage taken. So instead of having to do this setup every time, I can make kind of a global function that I can assign to any blueprint by using the blueprint function libraries. Okay, so here's the blueprint function I made. For input, it takes in a health component and a damage value. And just like before, it takes the current health, subtracts the damage from it and sets it as a new current health. Now in my BP player, I can delete all of these nodes and just add in my 
damage from health subtraction function. Connect the damage to damage, the health component to health component. And that's done. In this video, I would also like to prepare the crab to receive damage because in the next video, we're going to teach Raymond how to throw a punch. Okay, so let's add our receive damage event. Now let's put in our subtract damage function that we made. Take the health component, plug it in and take the damage. Now we need a branch. Here we get our current health after the subtraction and compare it. Now we check if the health value after taking damage is larger than, larger than zero. If it is, we set has taken damage to true. So the proper animation gets played. And if this is false, we set has died to true. So the dying animation plays. Then I want to destroy the actor. However, first I want the death animation to play. So we'll add a delay. I happen to know that that animation is two and a half seconds long. So I'll just plug this in since that's not gonna change. So we have the damage behavior handled. And now the last thing I need to do to finish up this guy is to set him to be immune to damage while he's underground. Because when he's burrowed, that's just a visual thing. His actual collision is still above ground. I handle this through animation notifies again. So the burrow animation at some point fires off this animation notify, which is just disables the collision on the capsule component. And then on the surface animation, I have another animation notify that enables the collision once the crab shoots above ground. I also disable the collision in begin play here in code because the crab always spawns underground. Episode seven, player combat. I guess this is the most important topic for the game alongside movement. This one will also be a two-parter. In this one, I'll try to go over the code and logic stuff and I'll leave the next one for more of the visual stuff. So like UI and particle systems. Anyway, let's first check out how the original was made and then how I tried to recreate this. Okay, so when I attack, the fists move forward a set amount and then they start returning. I can't attack until my fist has returned. So that's the thing to know. Um, Rayman also has this kind of battle mode where he actually starts strafing. During this mode, he can curve his punches. So we're gonna have to make a curve projectile again. Also, his fists aren't actually disappearing when he's throwing them. That's something I would like to fix, actually. Of course, we can also charge the attack. And also, Rayman has a combat roll that he can do both in battle mode or not. Now, if there's an enemy in sight, we have this little arrow pointing towards him. Using the strafe mode or battle mode causes the camera to lock on to the enemy. And if I move sideways, the target arrow shows me I'm gonna curve my punch or not. And when an enemy is hit, this text gets spawned over him, which is a very nice punchy effect. So I made the new input mapping and set it so whenever I hold the right mouse button, Rayman's battle mode is active. When I say battle mode, I mean that he's in this strafing mode. And here's the updated code for the strafe movement. So instead of taking the input's length, like previously, I set Rayman's X velocity to be equal to the input Y axis, since Y axis is the front and back arrow keys. And what is also different from before, instead of just multiplying this thing by the input value, like last time, I multiply it by the absolute value of input Y. And that's because input Y isn't always positive. When I'm holding the back key, it's minus one. And then I do the same thing for run velocity Y. So Rayman's sideway movement. If battle mode is active, I also change the max movement speed to a strafe movement speed that I can change in the blueprint. This also requires one change in Rayman's non-battle mode movement. I need to set the run velocity's Y component to zero because otherwise if I leave battle mode while moving to the side, the sideways movement will continue. 
As for the camera pawn, the only thing it really has to do while Rayman is in battle mode, it has to keep its position reset to be at all times behind Rayman. Now to make Rayman find targets to lock onto, I made a new game trace channel just for the Rayman targets. And then I use a capsule trace that traces from Rayman's position to a set range in front of him. If this trace finds a valid target, it sets the Rayman's chosen target to this actor. If it doesn't however find anything, I have a backup sweep target that's it uses a bigger capsule. I do this so if there are more than one targets in front of Rayman, I want Rayman to focus on the one that's most in front of him. If the second sweep, however, doesn't find anything, the chosen target returns null. So this is kind of how it worked in the original game, I think, but I'm not really a fan of this system. I would much rather prefer if I could change the chosen targets just by pressing some kind of button, like it usually is in games with a lock-on mechanic. But that's something I might do in the future. For now, this is good enough. Okay, so if Rayman finds a chosen target and he enters battle mode, I set Rayman's rotation to be facing his chosen target. And as you can see, I'm running around the Crab Ninja nicely now. Okay, so time for rolling. Now, as the input goes, whenever I press the roll button, I set an is rolling state to true. I do this so Rayman knows he's rolling and he can like move or jump while he's rolling. And I also made this variable called prime next roll. This is here, so if you press the roll button while Rayman is still rolling, but he's near the end of the roll, you will roll again. This is kind of a quality of life feature for the player. It just feels better because otherwise, sometimes you think you press the roll and Rayman should roll, but in actuality, he was still rolling, so you don't roll. <laughs> and you know. Now, for the roll itself, let's start when you're not in the battle mode. So I have this variable start roll velocity that I can change the blueprint. This is kind of the starting speed of the roll. And then once Rayman starts rolling, he is offset by this roll velocity, but with every frame, roll velocity is decreasing by a roll deceleration variable, which is also configurable in the blueprint. So you can kind of change how far you want Rayman to roll. And then I have this clamp. So roll velocity doesn't go below zero. The 1000 is just this kind of arbitrary value that I expect roll velocity will never be near. So then we set this value to the roll velocity's X component and we offset Rayman by this roll velocity value. Also, once roll velocity becomes less than zero, that's when I set Rayman is rolling state to false. So Rayman knows he can start moving normally again. Now the battle mode rolling is pretty much the same, except I just need to handle the roll velocity X component and the roll velocity Y component, depending on which arrow keys we're holding at the moment. And also when setting the roll velocity, for example, here in the X component, I need to multiply this by the input sign because for example, if we're holding the back key, we want Raymond to start rolling backwards. So we need the roll velocity to be in the negative. Okay, let's check this out. Great, I can roll. And if I'm in combat mode, I also roll. I of course set everything up in the animation blueprint prior to this, so the animations work. Okay, so let's move on to the fists now. But warning, brace yourselves. This is gonna be really messy. <laughs> this is at a point where I was really getting tired of C++ and I was trying to kind of move this into blueprints. Let's just say bad code, but it works. So I'll try to focus more on the logic and not on the code itself. So the kind of logic flow of Rayman throwing his fists would look something like this. We press the button. If we're holding the button, Rayman's charging his fist. Once we let go, we throw them with a set damage. First, we throw the right one. If we press the button again before the right fist returns, that's when we start charging or shooting the left fist. Once we shoot the fist, that's when we spawn this projectile that's just a collision. We tell the animation graph to snap Rayman's fist to this projectile. And once the fist reaches its target, it tells Rayman, hey, I'm your, for example, right fist and I'm returning now. And once the fist returns, then Rayman knows he can shoot his right fist again. If he can't and he wants to shoot, he has to shoot his left fist. And if neither of his fists are back yet, then he can't 
attack at the moment. So I start by making a new C++ class for the projectiles. I just give it a collider as I'm going to copy the fists location to this projectile. On the Raymond Pawn, I have a shoot fists function. And what this does is spawns the fist projectile, sets Raymond to his owner, sets Rayman's right fist launch to true, so Rayman can't launch this again until the fist returns. I also have a variable in the fist projectile is left fist. This is here so Rayman knows which fist reached his target, so he knows which fist to start returning to his body. Right fist blend is for the animation blueprint, so the blueprint knows that Rayman's right fist should be snapped to the projectile's location. Then we set the projectile's damage to a damage we calculated in a different function here in Rayman Pawn that I'll move to in a moment. Last shot damage is for particles and stuff, so we'll leave this for now. And the shoot right fist event is an event that's made in blueprints that's called here. That event kind of handles more the animation and visual side of things. So like spawning particles and setting variables for the animation blueprint. So to quickly recap, when we call the shoot fist, we spawn the fist projectile and feed both Rayman and the fist projectile all the necessary information they need, like the fist's damage, whether the fist is the left fist or the right fist, or that the fist has been launched. Let's move on to how I set the fist's damage. Here I have the charge fist event, and what this does, it adds damage to the fist as it's being charged. Here we can see the fist damage increases using a fist charge speed variable that I use. And I clamp the damage to a value between one and three, as I don't want the fist damage to be higher than that. And to simplify the damage values, I use a floor. So if fist damage is, for example, 1.5, I convert it to being just one. So in other words, I just want integer values for the fist damage. Also here we tell Rayman that we're charging the left fist right now if the right fist has been launched. So now I can charge the fist by holding the left mouse button and once I let go, it gets spawned. Now I give the projectile a max range and also use a sphere trace to see if the projectile will hit anything on its travels. So now if the projectile hits something or flies further than its range, we tell Rayman which fist reached its target and we destroy the projectile. I also want to quickly note that if this hits something, we apply damage. In the previous video, I said you need to add this dynamic unhit function. However, I didn't do that for the projectile and yet it's still dealing damage, so. Now here in the animation graph, in this bo yellow box over here is all the logic that makes Rayman's fist snap to the projectile's location. This upper half is for the right fist and this lower half is for the left fist. So right fist location is the location of the projectile. And we move the hand's right bone, so that's the right hand, to the projectile's location. Then I move the fingers and the thumb. I mean, I actually rotate them just to form a fist. I don't need to move them because they're parented to the hand. And I also change the scale a little bit. I make the fist larger so it looks scarier. So here's what happens with the fist when right fist blend is one. It, it changes into a fist and scales up. Right now it moves to a location, to zero, zero, zero location because right, it doesn't have any location for the projectile because there are none. But if there was a right fist projectile in the scene, it would move it to the projectile's location. So what I want to do is when Rayman's right fist reaches his target, I want this blend to go back to zero, but I wanted to do it gradually since I don't want his fist just to snap back to their original position, but to actually travel from the projectile's location back to Rayman. And here's the code for that. So if right fist reaches his target, right fist blend decreases gradually. And once right fist blend is close to zero, I just snap it to zero and set right fist reaches target to false. So I think that covers Rayman's projectile spawning, at least broadly speaking. However, the way this works right now is that as soon as I let go of the button, I will shoot the fist instantly, which doesn't look very good. Uh, you need some kind of wind up animation to feel the impact of the punch or have some kind of anticipation that it's going to happen. 
So I made this animations myself. Here's the left fist punch animation. This doesn't change much in the code. All it really changes is that when I press the shoot button, I don't actually spawn the fist, but I start playing this animation. And once a certain time frame passes during this animation, I check the input again. If during this input check, I'm no longer holding the shoot button, then I just shoot the fist. But if I'm still holding the left mouse button, then I start charging the fist and shoot as soon as I let go. Okay, so let's make the fist fly towards its enemies and curving left and right. So I can't just copy the fist's behavior from the ninja crab because the ninja crab's projectile will fly to whatever the player was when they were spawned. And Rayman fists, they home to their targets, so you can't outrun them. Every frame they will be flying towards their target's current location. So instead what I do, every frame I rotate the fist to face the chosen target and then I move them forward along their forward vector. Now for the curved punch throw, I did almost the same thing I did for the ninja crab, except instead of offsetting the projectile using its right vector, I use this formula to rotate the fist and then tell it to move forward. So instead of moving forward and to the side, like the starfish projectile, it first rotates and then moves. This change was kind of dictated by the fact that the starfish projectile spins at all time on its axis so there's no point in rotating it while the fist doesn't so making it oriented towards its path looks just much better. I don't have any fast moving targets yet in the game to check if this would work for enemies that move pretty quickly but I think I'll just cross that bridge when I get there. Now to decide whether the fist should curve left or right I have this throw direction variable and this variable gets set through Rayman's right vector velocity so if Rayman's moving to the right, the sign of this value will be 1 and he will curve his fist to the right. If he's moving to the left, the sign of this value will be minus 1 and he will curve his punch to the left. And if it's 0, then he will just hit straight on. Very cool. Now we can fight the crab and the crab can fight us. There is something, however, I think I should change the future. And that is instead of snapping Rayman's fist to the projectile, actually have the projectile have its own fist model and just hide Rayman's actual fist while his fists are traveling to his target. And that's because of this bug over here. This is caused by Rayman's skeletal mesh moving out of his bounds. I could fix this by increasing this value over here, but it says that this decreases lighting quality and that is perform more performance heavy. I don't really know how much, but still I don't think it's a great idea to just set this to some kind of huge value. Although maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it would be better to first check this before going in and changing everything. So the logic is ready, now we can put in some visual flair. Let's start with the charging fist particle effect. So this is the charging fist effect. I make it start from this kind of purple color because I figured Rayman's purple. <laughs> so, And then it goes into orange and starts to glow white while it's fully charged. Also as it's fully charged we have these little sparks going inside. And we have the fist rotating at all times. So the fist is a single particle that gets spawned and it has this rotate around point node here to rotate in a circle. Now for the trail, it uses the same trail material as the crab ninja, except instead of being mapped to a plane, it's mapped to a cylinder. Here in the ribbon shape, I have a tube. Now the, two, the ribbon particles for the trail get spawned from the fist's location, so it indeed follows the fist. I have a scale ribbon width that scales with the emitter's age, so the tube is larger the more the fist is charged. And I also have a second scale ribbon width to kind of enlarge the end of the trail. This kind of makes more of a vortex effect as without this it's just something like this. And the color nose changes the color from this purple to glowing orange. And I also use the dynamic material parameter to make it glow stronger. Just like we saw when we were going over the material for the crab enemy. Now the long sparks are a little too simple to go over I think, but really quickly they use the basic particle material. 
they get spawned on a sphere and I use a point attraction force to make them travel to the center of the particle effect. I guess one thing I do with the sparks that I haven't done before is I elongate them as they speed up and I use this by scaling the sprite size by speed. So the faster they go, the more scaled up they are in the Y axis. To make this work properly in the sprite renderer, you need to make the alignment velocity aligned. As for the projectile effect itself, this is what I got. This is what we would see if the if Rayman shot the fully charged fist. So kind of like two trails, one that's longer but thinner, and then there's another one that's larger. And there are also these embers that get left behind. I hope you can see them in the video. Now this particle effect has a user variable that I defined that takes in the fist's damage. So that was what the particle would look like if the fist's damage was equal to three. But if, for example, we don't charge the fists at all, then the effect is much smaller. Then if I change it to, for example, two, so it's like halfway, then it grows to match whatever the particle looked like when Raymond was charging his fist. So I don't think there's much point in going over the effect itself. It's the same trail material I've been using before, just layered a couple times on top to give it some more punch. And then the embers are just these tiny spots that get spawned and use a curl noise to move around. The only thing that's different is this user parameter I was talking about. It's called color scale. And here in the color of this trail nose, I have these curves that are driven by the color scale. So if the color scale is one, then we have the whatever color is in this spot over here. If color scale is three, then we have whatever the color is over here in this spot. And in order to set that color scale value in Blueprint, what you need to do is there's this set Niagara by variable node. I was using a float. So here you just type in the na name of the variable. In my case, it's user color scale. So user dot color scale. And then here you can plug in the value. Okay, so let's check this out. If I just press the button, we have a nice purple trail. And as I start charging, the trail matches whatever the color was when Raymond stop, stopped charging. We can go to max. There it is. I don't know if you noticed, I also added a camera shake for when Raymond uses max power. Adding a camera shake is super simple. You just put in a new blueprint class, search in camera shake. And here, once you select your shake pattern, you get all these settings like location shake, rotation, FOV, timing. And then to add it to blueprints, you just use play world camera shake. Select your camera shake you created, and that's pretty much it. The last thing I did regarding kind of the visuals of the punch is response to the terrain. So whenever the fist hits anything, I play this dirt particle effect and spawn this kind of fist decal on the wall. For the particle effect that spawns whenever the fist hits a wall, I reused the smoke and dirt particle systems from the Crab Ninja. For the decal itself, first I sculpted in Zebra something that kind of resembles three fingers going into a wall. Then I took the sculpt into Substance Painter to bake it on a flat plane and paint in the opacity. And then I made a decal material in Unreal Engine. I used a normal map of the fist. For the color, I just figured something white to match his fist's color is enough. So this decal kind of works with any surface. I also dim the opacity down a little bit so it's a little see-through. This also makes it work a little better with any surface. And then I plugged in this decal lifetime opacity. This allows us to change the decal's opacity and blueprint over its lifetime so it smoothly fades out instead of just disappearing. Now to set up the particle and the decal, I have this event, hit something event, that fires whenever the fist collides with anything. So first I spawn that particle system at the fist's location. I feed in the fist's damage again because I made this particle also grow in size if the damage is larger. 
so a stronger fist makes more dirt and smoke. And then for the decal, there's a spawn decal at location node where I choose my fist decal. I set the decal size to something that works. For the location, I also take the actor location. And for the rotation, I get the impact normal of the fist and flip it because otherwise the decal turns out to be inside out. And then I make a rotation from this vector to plug it into the spawn decal location. Then there's the set fade out node that makes the decal fade out smoothly. So after 20 seconds, it fades out for 10 seconds. And when it fades out, the decal gets destroyed. Okay, now I wanna go over making this target arrow. First, let's go over the widget blueprint. So we'll make the UI element and then we'll go over connecting it to the enemy crab, for example. So here in the designer, we got this arrow with the crosshair. I've taken the textures from the original game, just upscaled them a little bit. I added this pulsating animation because that was something that was there in the original game. Now let's go over the event graph. So there are kind of two things that I need to happen here. One is to rotate the arrow to be always pointing from Rayman to the target. And the other thing is to change the arrow to indicate to the player that he's going to curve his fist if he shoots it now. And one other thing I have to deal with is I don't really like how the crosshair kind of seems to be shrinking down as I get closer to the enemy. This is something that Unreal does if I set the blueprint widget to screen. So I want to compensate for that and make it scale and make the UI element scale up depending on how close I am to the target. Okay, first things first in event construct, I play the animation. If I set number of loops to zero, then it will loop indefinitely. And now let's get to the logic. So first I get the distance of the target to the player pawn. By the way, this is when I learned about blueprint interfaces and I started using them. I followed this tutorial to learn about them. But very briefly, so we're all on the same page, blueprint interfaces allow me, for example, to get some values that are on the BP player without casting to the BP player. So anyway, I get the distance from Rayman to his target. That is a variable that I have on Rayman. And I use this to scale up the circle. I have this simple function here that I made. This node over here is kind of the meat of the function. It divides one by the player distance to the target. So now if the player is very close to his target, so like 10 centimeters, then one divided by 10 will be 0.1. But if Rayman is, for example, 500 centimeters from the target, then one divided by 500 is 0 0.02. So this value decreases the further away Rayman is from his target. So now I can take the UI element scale and multiply it by this value, which will cause the UI element to shrink the further away Rayman is. Also, I need to multiply this by the transform scale of this image because of the pulsating animation. Otherwise, this formula would just override the scaling that comes from the pulsating animation, so no animation would be visible. Now for the arrow image, I scale it with a similar function, but that takes into account that there is no animation here. And then I get the arrow rotation. This is a function I made that gives me a rotation value for the arrow image to make it look like the arrows pointing from Rayman to its target. Let me get inside this function to explain how it finds the arrows rotation. I'd say this is somewhat similar to what I've been doing in C++ to rotate Rayman in relation to the camera. Up here I use a dot product between a vector that's created from the target location to the player camera and the vector from the target to the player and I convert it to an angle value. So now instead of getting a value between minus one and one, I get a value between minus 90 and 90. Then I subtract this by 90, so the range is from negative 180 to zero. So that handles rotating the camera in one direction, but we still need to be able to rotate from zero degrees to positive 180. And that gets handled by this second dot product over here. This is a dot product between the vector created by the target's location subtracted from the player camera's location and the camera's right vector. Now I'm just interested in the sign 
value of this dot product so whether it returns a positive value or negative value since all i want to do here is just flip these values to be positive so obviously i should have used the sign node here i don't know why i made this little setup however this does the same thing that the sign node does so it just returns negative one or positive one so now if i multiply these two values i get a full range from minus 180 degrees to 180 degrees and once that is handled, all that's left is to swap the arrow images for the curved arrow images, depending on the player's velocity, player's Y velocity, actually. So if the player is running right, we want the right curved arrow. If the player is running left, we want to change it to the left curved arrow. And if the player is running for forward, then we want the straight arrow or if he's sta standing still. So the way I do this is I get the player's Y velocity and compare it to his previous frame Y velocity. I do this so I don't set the UI image every frame. I'm not sure how bad that is for, for performance. So this is kind of a check to see if we need to swap the image or not. So if they are not equal, then we go to this compare flow where we compare the velocity Y with zero. So if the Y velocity is bigger than zero, we change the image to the right curved arrow image. If it's equal to zero, we change it to the straight arrow. And if velocity y is less than zero we change it to the left arrow and then at the end i set velocity previous frame to be velocity y so the next frame we can compare it the new velocity with the velocity from this frame okay i hope i didn't make that too complicated now let's connect this thing to the crab ninja and see it in action so to connect this i add a widget class Set the UI, set the widgets class to the class we went over. I changed the space to screen. And now I just got to make the crab decide whether the widget should be visible or not, depending on if he's Rayman's current target. Doing this is very simple. I just get Rayman's chosen target and check if his chosen target is this crab and then just set the visibility based on that. However, I made the same optimization as last time to check if the vis UI visibility last frame was the same as this frame. I don't know if this is necessary, probably not, but I did it anyway. Okay, so if we fight him, the arrow switches as we move. And also the arrows pointing from Rayman to the crab. And let's not forget about this feature where the UI size scales nicely now. Now there's one more thing that's missing from the gameplay we analyzed in the previous video. And that's the words that spawn on the screen whenever you hit the enemy. Again, I took the textures from the original game as I think they look really cool. Here I have the material that I use for this particle system. I know it looks a little scary, but it really is very simple. The idea here is to get a number from the particle system and use that number to randomize between one of these five textures. So I have these if statements that compare the number I get from the particle system to this second number. And depending on which of these two values are bigger, the if statement returns one of these two values. So zero or one. So let's, for example, quickly analyze this lerp over here that if alpha is zero, we will have the first texture. And if alpha is one, we will see the two, the second texture. So let's say, for example, that A is larger than B. That means that the value we got for the, from the particle system is larger than one. Then we feed in one into the lerp alpha. So the second texture will be visible. However, if the particle system gives us a value of zero, for example, then A is less than B. So the if statement returns zero and plugs it into the alpha, making the first texture get displayed. And that's the whole logic behind this. The only thing I've done is layer a couple lerps and if statements on top of each other. So I don't randomize between two textures, but between five textures. However, I'm not gonna lie, this is pretty dumb in my opinion. <laughs> Later on in the project, I reminded myself that there exists something called flipbook animation, which goes pretty well with particle systems. A flipbook would be if I took these five textures and put them all on one single texture. Later on in the project, I have a flipbook particle system so i'll go over that 
when we get there. But well, I guess if I ever need to randomize between textures and I for some reason can't use flip books, I have a way. Oh, one more important thing to know. In the material over here, I disable depth test. I do this so we have this word that spawns always in front of everything else. It makes it work more like some kind of comic book overlay than if it was actually in the scene. Okay, so for the particle effect, the particle gets spawned somewhere on a sphere. This dynamic material par parameter returns a random range flow to randomize between, between different words. I have one scale sprite size over here that kind of makes the particle pop in and a scale color to make it kind of fade out over lifetime. Now, I have this user variable called damage taken that is used to drive the particle scale again. I do this because I wanted this particle to be larger if the enemy takes a bigger hit. So if we change the damage to three, as you can see, it's pretty big. And then we go back to one, it's a smaller. All right, crab guy doesn't stand any chances. Yes, I have been adding sounds in the meantime. I don't think I'm gonna make any videos on that, however, because there's just nothing interesting to be said about adding sounds. The whole process boils down to me spending an hour combing through the Rayman sound files to find the one that I need, and then just spawning it whenever something happens. So, for example, here when the enemy gets hit, you just spawn the sound at the enemy location. Hello again. In this episode, I'm gonna talk about making the game's starting area. The process of making this area is pretty much the same as for the last area, so let's just rapid fire through some models. Terrain mesh. Now give me some trees. Okay, nice, but I think it's a little dark. Let's liven up the place. Okay, gotta drop in some boulders now. So that's all I can make with the models I have. Time to make some new ones. First, these flat rocks for platforming. And now the broken cart. All I'm really missing here is just the wheel since I'm gonna build the rest of the cart from the planks I already have. There should also be a tiny one here in the corner. Now the helpful rock pointing you in the right direction. I made a new shader where the green vertex channel becomes an emission mask. I think adding some foliage will top off this little montage I got going here nicely. Okay, so now I'm missing a couple more complex models, so let's go over them one by one. Starting with these red glowing mushrooms. So here's the model I sculpted. I want to make it three separate models. One for the base, one for this kind of flower, let's call it. And then have this little part in the middle be a separate one as well. I want to do this to give some variation to the mushrooms on the level easily. I think this guy deserves his own dedicated texture. So as you can see, separating the mushroom into three models make it easier to make them have different height or I can lay out these little baby mushrooms around easily now. 
I made the shader a little more interesting than just using the textures I painted. As you can see, I try to give it this effect of kind of this inner glow. So like they're a little translucent and have something glowing deeper inside. The way I did this is very simple. I just used the Fresnel node. There are probably like hundreds of tutorials online on the Fresnel node, but very briefly, it's basically a black and white mask that gets driven by the viewing angle. So if I look at this plane head on, it's pretty black, but as I start looking at it from the side, it gets brighter. So now by inverting the Fresnel node, I have this glow that seems to always be in the middle of the model. Now near the mushrooms, there's this cat cat caterpillar, however you say it. Anyway, let's go make this cute little guy. I made him a simple skeleton for the bounce animation. Now to make the catter cattle cattle put now to make the cattle pillar launch Rayman, I add in a box collision and then the cat, the bug mesh itself, and I add the va variable jump z velocity that's gonna set Rayman's z velocity whenever he collides with the with this bug. And here in the event graph, all we have is on component begin overlap when the collision box overlaps with the player pawn through an interface we add in z velocity to rayman and set his launch state to true i'm using interfaces here but from what i've heard i don't know if that's correct i've heard that using a cast instead is isn't worse performance wise because the player pawn will always be loaded in memory anyway if anyone can confirm or, or deny in the comments i'd be greatly appreciated anyway after the player is launched the caterpillar plays its bounce animation and plays a bouncy sound. And while we're on the topic of cute animals, there are these butterflies here flying around that I gotta make. And also these turtles that, well, you know, are doing something. It's kind of cool how when you run up, they kind of hide. You can also kick them. There's also one animal that's not so cute. Actually, a bit scary. There's another one up over there. The butterflies kind of seem to start flying around you once you come close enough. And once you get out of their range, they kind of scatter, I guess. I'll try to make something similar. For the butterfly model, I guess you could say I left it in the blocking stage. It's just such a small part of the screen that there's really no point in going into more detail. And here's the model painted in Substance Painter. I kept it all in the base color because this model is going to have a translucent shader without any pins or specularity or even like a normal map, I think. I made the wing flapping in the material itself. So this is a static mesh, not a rigged model. The material is translucent, like I said. So the butterfly is a little bit see-through. Oh, actually there is a normal map here. I was wrong. But I think this isn't necessary. If I delete this, it looks exactly the same. So I use a Fresnel again for the emissive. And for the rotation of the wings, I use the rotate about axis again. This time without the normal fixing because you can't really see the normals here anyway. So to have the wings animated, I plug in into the rotation amount a sign function that takes in a time node. To control how far the wings flap, I have this rotation amount user parameter. And I use a vertex color again to mask out what should be rotating. That's why the wings are rotating only and not the whole butterfly itself. I have these four nodes over here to kind of divide the mesh in half. So the right half is black and the left half is white. 
That's because without this, the wings do something like this. So they're basically rotating together. So to fix this, I kind of divide this model in two halves. The white part is equal to one and the black part is minus one. So I can multiply the wing rotation by this mask and the wing that is in minus one, that's in black, will have its rotation inverted, which fixes the effect. Now, maybe let me explain why those four nodes do that so you don't have to take what I'm saying at face value. I take the absolute world position of this butterfly and convert it to its local space. So now the pivot point is 0, 0, 0. And let's take, for example, the Y axis. So this green one over here. Every point on the butterfly that's to the left of his pivot point has some kind of positive Y axis value and everything to the right has a negative value that's why i use this mask green node because the y component is green so what this does is essentially masks out the x component or x axis and the z axis and just leaves me with the y axis and now if i feed that into a sign node everything that's on the left of the butterfly's pivot point returns one and everything to the right of the butterfly's pivot point returns minus one. Moving on. I also have this per instance random node here. Because I'm gonna use instance static meshes, every one of these butterflies is gonna have its own random index or random seed, some kind of random number basically. So if, if I add this to the time, that way it's not gonna be like where all the butterflies are flapping their wings together. And then I have a very simple setup for the up and down movement. So just using a sign function, I offset the butterfly in the Z axis. Now here's the blueprint. I have this box as a parent, which is gonna act as the bounds in which these butterflies follow Rayman. So when Rayman overlaps with this box, the butterflies start following them, following him. Then I have a track, thanks to which I can make the butterflies move around on a spline. I have this one particle system that uses the flare texture that's used in the Fairy Council episode. It's very similar to the particle system near the button, except it doesn't move like in a vortex. I also add the point light to give the, to make them kind of illuminate the scene. And the butterfly is an instant static mesh that actually gets called in the constructor. So this is the first blueprint that utilizes the constructor. What this does, allow, it allows me to kind of change this blueprint in editor. Let me show you what I mean. So here we have the butterflies. As you can see, I made a track for them. And now in the blueprint, I have these settings like butterflies amount and it updates on the fly. So one or 20. I can also change the butterfly scale and distance between the butterflies on the curve. I think it's gonna be easier this time if I show this working in action and then we go over the blueprint. So there, there they are flying in the distance. If you can see the light source seems to be snapped to the middle butterfly. Also, except for that one particle effect that's attached to the blueprint, every butterfly emits its own other particle effect Although it might be for you a little bit hard to distinguish which particle effect is coming from the butterfly and which one is this global one I was showing in the beginning. And so they're following me as long as I'm in their box. If I leave, they leave back to their original place and start just flying around where they were. Okay, so let's go over the construction graph and the event graph now. Starting with the construction graph, do I have this butterfly amount? variable that allows me to choose how many but butterflies are flying around in that spot. And I plug it into a for loop. A for loop will execute code a set amount of times. So if I tell the for loop to spawn a butterfly and I set the butterfly amount to three, then the for loop will spawn a butterfly three times. Okay, so in this for loop, first I add an instance of a butterfly and I set its transforms to be at the right spot along this spline. To find its location, I first get a reference to the spline. I multiply the index of the for loop with the distance between the butterflies. The index is basically which iteration of the for loop is being executed currently, starting at zero 
So if the index is zero, then this is the first loop. If the index is one, then we're talking about the second loop and so on. So if the index is zero, the first butterfly will spawn on the spline track at zero distance. Distance is basically the length of the spline. Yeah, so if the index of the butterfly is one, for example, and our distance between butterflies is 50, then the next butterfly will spawn 50 units along the spline in front of the first one. I also rotate the butterflies in their z-axis to kind of face where they are flying to, towards. That makes them, their movement a little more natural. And then for every butterfly, I add a Niagara particle system. This one over here, that kind of looks maybe heavier because the stars are falling. Let me show you the first one, what, what it looked like for comparison. The first one is a, a little more floaty, while the second one is kind of like this. I make an array out of all of these Niagara particle systems for later, because in event tick, I will want to copy every butterfly's location to the particle system's location so it so it seems like the particle system is spawned by the butterfly so that's it for the constructor now let's move on to the event graph we have these kind of three parts i would say let's go over first the overlapping because this is the simplest one so if rayman overlaps with that box then i set the is following player to true and once he leaves the box i set the is following player back to false so now in event tick we check if is following player is true. And if it is true, I, I wanna set this butterfly track world location to Rayman's world, lo world location. And that's simple, except I wanna use a lerp so they don't just snap and they actually travel to, Ray to Rayman. And that also would be very simple and wouldn't require all of these nodes over here, except for the fact that the way the lerp works is that the further Rayman is from the butterfly track, the faster the butterflies will fly to Rayman, which isn't ideal. I would like them to kind of travel to Rayman at, at a steady speed. So this is what these nodes handle over here. Basically, they check the distance to Rayman and the higher the distance is, the smaller the lerp speed is while still clamping it to some kind of reasonable values. So the lerp speed will never get, for example, less than one and more than four. But basically, if Rayman is very far, then the lerp speed is one, but if Rayman is near them, the lerp speed increases. So it kind of seems like they're moving towards Rayman at a steady rate. Coming back to the branch, if is following player is false, then what I want to do is have the butterflies move back to their original location. So basically the track lerps back to its starting location, also scaling the lerp speed to, main st to maintain a steady travel speed. Then there's the butterfly movement along the spline. I made this move along spline function that takes in the instance index. So we have this for loop again that iterates over every butterfly. Let's check out the, this function. Okay, I'm gonna be going over this as if we're talking about the butterfly with index zero. It, and just keep in mind, this does the same thing for every butter, other butterfly. So first we get the location of the butterfly with the index zero in this example. And then we feed in that location to determine what's this butterfly's distance along this spline at this location. And I set this to a variable. Then I increase the distance value by some kind of speed that I can set. The higher the speed I make, the faster the butterflies move along the spline, of course. And then I update this butterfly's location to be at the location of our new distance. So this is kind of the same thing that we had in the constructor, except it's just moving the butterfly along the spline and not just spawning him in a set location. This part over here is just to make the butterfly go around the loop. So if the distance becomes larger than the spline length, then I set the distance to zero and set the butterfly's location to this di new distance. Okay, let's move back out of this function. Now all this does is attaches those particle systems to the butterflies. So for every particle system I created, I set it, its world location to the butterfly's location with a matching index. And once this loop is completed, I still need to move along the spline the global particle system and the light source. So for the global particle system, I attach it to the butterfly with the last index. That's because actually the last butterfly is the one that's moving in the front and not the first one, a little counterintuitive. And then for the point light, I kind of imagine it makes more most sense to have the light source coming out of the middle of all the, of all the butterflies. So I take the instance count and divide it by two. 
and snap the vice location to whatever butterfly is in the middle of the group. And that's the whole butterfly system. Yeah, so I didn't make them scatter when they're not following Rayman, which probably wouldn't be too hard if I were to do this. I would make it where if the butterflies aren't following Rayman, I would make them travel to random locations in that overlap box. But I kind of like them flying around in distance in unison like that. Before I continue on with the wildlife and such, I'd like to add in the second area. So why don't we kick this off with a montage again? This mushroom is just a yellow mushroom with a different color texture. In the original, this area had some water and waterfalls. I followed Prismatica Dev's tutorials for water shader, and this is the effect. I also added the water shader to this area over here. The shader is very simple, but I'm not going to go over it since I'd be pretty much just repeating the same thing that Prismatica Dev said in his video. So if you're interested in how this works, just go watch that video. By the way, I made this particle effect that spawns whenever rain walks in water. But I'm not going to go over how this is connected in this video. I think all the footstep response stuff will fit better in a different video. Let's move on to the bouncy mats. These are pretty cool because the bouncy animation is also done on the shader. So here's the ZBrush sculpt. And then the texture. I use the cloth shading model, but I don't think it's really necessary here. It doesn't change much visually. Another thing I added that probably no one will notice is a tiling detail normal. But now at least you know, and that's enough for me. Now for the bouncing animation. Here I have this bounce time variable. For now, think of it as just a time node because it is essentially that with one change. So by feeding the time node to the sign function, I can make the bouncy mat move up and down since it's plugged here to the Z axis and then to the world position offset. And now it's just a matter of masking out the edges of the, of the bouncy rag. So the bouncy animation happens in the middle and gradually fades out as it goes outward. So the mask is kind of done how it is in the butterflies, where I find the distance from the object's pivot point, except this time I keep a gradient. And it would seem that this is all we need, but this is what happens when I start jumping on the bouncy mask now. 
As you can see, all of them are moving. The simplest way to fix this would be to use a dynamic material instance, but at the time I did not know about those yet, so I had to come up with a different solution. I mask out the bouncy mats with the player's location, so now it will only move the cloth piece that Raymond actually jumped on. To be able to feed in these custom variables, you need to make a material parameter collection, like this one I have over here, bounce trigger, and it has the two parameters I made, bounce time and that's a float and a vector that takes in the player location. So now let's move to the jump rag blueprint to actually set these material parameters. Let's start with on component begin overlap. So once Rayman overlaps with the jump rug, this part is the same as with the caterpillar. So it just launches him up. However, here we set the player location parameter to this actor's location. It doesn't really matter if I feed in here this actor's location or player's location since they're pretty much in the same spot once the overlap happens. And then I set the time value to some kind of starting time value that I set. Now the bigger the starting time value is, the longer the bounce animation will be. And now let's go to event tick. So first we check if time is larger than zero because it initializes as zero. So until Rayman overlaps with the jump rug, it won't be anything else than zero because that's when we set the, start the time to some kind of starting time. And then the bouncing animation happens. So we feed in the time value to the material parameter. And every frame, as long as time is bigger than zero, we decrease its value. So this way the animation lasts only until time reaches zero, which is perfect because remember, I'm feeding this time value into a sign function and sign zero is also zero. So this way I'm sure that once time reaches zero, the jump rock will also be in a neutral position and not stuck somewhere in the middle of the animation. For the turtles, I have this basic functionality where when two turtles are next to each other, they emit this particle and play this animation. Once I run up to them, they kind of stop, start staring at me. If I move too close, they kind of hide in their shell. Although I would like for this animation to be maybe a little more pronounced. It's hard to notice that they're actually hiding in their shell. And also I haven't made the ability to kick the turtles. So basically, as they're not really done yet, let's just look at the models themselves. I'll go over them in a separate video once they're actually finished. Also, I would like for everyone to see that there's a turtle chilling here in the water. scared yet? Well, you should be. I painted him in ZBrush because since he's always hidden in the trees and very small, I don't think there's any reason to make a separate texture for him. Just painting in the colors will do the trick. In the original game, since he was just a 2D plane with a texture, all he could do was just wink. However, since I made an actual model for him, I decided to make him look at the player at all times. I think this makes him a little more scary. To make him look at Rayman, I separated this monster into two parts. One is the eye and one is the pupil itself. The pupil has this pivot where rotating the pupil makes it travel naturally on the eye. And then in the blueprint, all that I'm doing is I use the find look at rotation node to set the pupil's rotation to be looking at Rayman. This node for its calculations takes in the, st the location of the pupil and the location of the player and does all the rest. The only other thing I had to do is to kind of clamp the pupil's movement so it doesn't move out of the eye like this. And I do this using our trusty dot product. I bas basically check how disaligned the eye's forward vector is from the rest of the monster's forward vector. And once it reaches some kind of value, I feed it into this branch over here so it no longer sets the pupil's rotation. Although looking back at this, I think it would be simpler to just clamp the rotation values using some kind of clamp node. 
Okay, now these guys really annoyed me. Every one of them is pretty much different. And they're, I think they're used only here in the whole game. So it kind of pissed me off how much time I need to spend on them just for this one little tiny area. So in retaliation, I made them as lazily as possible. These are not my proudest sculpts. I even painted them in ZBrush so I don't have to deal with any texture painting. However, that also happens to be a good optimization. The lucky part about these gnomes is that actual real life garden gnomes I don't think look much better, so that kind of works out. This one's gonna get me banned. I wanted to try something a little more fun with these guys, so instead of making them just disappear when they get hit like in the original game, I make their heads fly off. And I made them physical objects so we can push them around. They deserved that. By the way, making Rayman push physical objects wasn't so simple since I'm using the collide and slide algorithm. To kind of move around that issue, I actually gave Rayman a second collider that's a little bigger than his normal collider. And all this physics collider does is it pushes physical objects around. It doesn't do anything with Rayman's movement or stuff like that. And also to make the heads kind of fly off and not just fall down as if there was no impact when they spawn, I add an impulse when they get spawned that's from the player's locations. So the direction in which the head flies off is kind of more natural. In the original game, when you would walk on mushrooms, this particle would spawn and also the mushrooms would kind of bounce underneath you. So I kind of made a similar thing. Except I gave the particle system some more color because it kind of looked like a fart, to be honest, when it was green. And now I think it looks a little more like mushroom spores. The blueprint is really simple and not much here is new. The only thing that we haven't seen before is this timeline over here. What this does, it kind of allows us to animate a variable over time using a curve. So if I click on this timeline, you see here is the curve that I made. And what this means essentially is that at the beginning of the timeline, so when it starts playing, the value of my float will be minus one and it gradually goes from minus one to one over the duration of 0.3 seconds. You can see that variable that is updated in the timeline is fed into add world offset of the mushroom. So since it starts from minus one, I have a strong downward offset, but as the value updates, the mushroom slows down and then starts going back up again. And then once the timeline finishes, I snap the mushroom to its starting location. This is just a safeguard because the timeline doesn't guarantee the mushroom will return to its exact original location. So by jumping on the mushroom, a lot of times you could probably move it further and further away from its original position. As someone who really likes stats, let's go over some just like we did with the fairy council. So to make these two additional locations, I made 30 new 3D models, eight of which were the gnomes actually. So two terrain pieces, nine different tree models, two tree tunnels, one arrow rock, one flat rock, one wooden wheel, one wall mushroom, and one tall mushroom. The butterflies, the turtles, the wall monsters, and the caterpillar. Combining this with the fairy council location, this adds up to 92 different 3D models. To be clear, I'm just talking about environment stuff, so I'm excluding everything that has to do with Rayman or the Crab Ninja. Now for the shaders, I made the shader for the blood butterfly, for the bouncy mats, the tall mushroom shader, a shader that just takes in vertex color for the wall monster or the garden gnomes, the water shader, a variation on the rock shader to make the glowing rock, and two new particle materials 
one for the turtle hearts and one for the water splash. So, so that's seven new materials and altogether 13 different master materials. For this location, I made five new particle systems, two for the butterflies, one for the turtle, one for the water splash and one for the mushroom spore. So altogether we have 12 particle systems so far. There were no new texture atlases or tileable textures, but seven new dedicated texture sets. One for the mushroom, one for the tall mushroom, one for the butterflies, one for the wall mushroom, the red mushroom, the caterpillar, and the turtle. So altogether that's 11 different dedicated texture sets and 18 texture sets overall. This week I want to talk about recreating the point system as well as making the point counter UI. Okay, so let's see what happens once I grab this crystal. The crystal plays an animation. There also spawns this 10 points to indicate how much points I got. And the UI updates with the amount of points I got. Also, there's this combo mode where things get really cool. If you get some more points while combo mode is on, then as soon as combo mode stops, those combo po points get added to the total points. I'd also like to refer to the Rayman 3 wiki for the scoring system because there are some things happening that aren't obvious from that gameplay. There are two different combo timers. One lasts two seconds and the other six seconds. The two second combo timer is reserved for whenever you pick up things like the jewels or the piggy banks. And the six second timer is reserved for killing enemies. So when you defeat an enemy, then you have six seconds before the combo mode stops. And the other thing that's happening kind of under the hood is that there's a combo multiplier going on. So the first one to five objects that you pick up behave normally where their points just get added into the combo timer and then the combo points are added to your points. But the more objects you pick up, the more valuable everything is in the combo counter. As it's written here, every object between the 6th and 10th object will have their points doubled and added to the combo counter. And it goes on like this every 5 objects, so between 11 to 15 the points are tripled, between 16 and 20 they are quadrupled, and, and then the maximum is when the points are quintupled. Okay, let's do this. For the crystal models, I took the exact same models that were in the game. I don't think there's really any need to upgrade them. And a quick look at the shader. I'm using rotate about world axis and fix rotate about axis normals. And I plugged in the Fresnel node to the emission channel just because I think they look pretty cool this way. First let's start with making the crystals move around Rayman when he collects them. As well as making this particle system. To make the crystal rotate around Rayman there's this node called rotate vector around axis that I'm using. The vector I feed in is the player's forward vector multiplied by negative 50. You can consider this the starting location of the crystal when it, start, when it starts rotating. For some reason I just decided that I wanted its rotation to start from behind the player. There's no particular reason for that. I multiplied it by 50 because you can consider this vector to be kind of the radius of the rotation. So this way the crystal will be rotating around the player at a distance of 50 units from him. The angle degree I'm feeding is increasing every frame. So this is what actually makes the crystal rotate around Rayman over time and not just snap to some kind of location. And for the axis, I of course chose choose the Z axis. So this basically handles creating the circle on which the crystal is located, but I but I now need to actually put the circle somewhere in the world. So this is this pivot location variable. And of course the pivot location is set to the player's location, since I want to create a cir circle around the player along which the crystal will be moving. Now to give the crystal a little more natural movement when the player is running around, I use a lerp, otherwise the crystal seems a little too stiff. So that's the movement around Rayman, but the crystal also moves upwards. So I also add an upward vector to the crystal every frame that I feed through a lerp to give it smoother movement. Now I didn't want the crystal to start moving upwards right away. So I have this branch over here in which the condition is the orbit angle. I made it so the crystal doesn't move upwards until the orbit is at least minus 720. So that's two rotations. This way the crystal first rotates around Rayman twice and then it starts moving upwards. And then one more thing, after the player overlaps with the crystal, I destroy the crystal after three seconds so the crystal doesn't travel upwards indefinitely. And then there's the particle system. 
Nothing new to discuss here. Just some curl noises and trails and reused materials. By the way, I used the flare texture for the ribbon here. The same one I used for the shooting stars and for the butterfly particle systems. So I guess you could call this a bit of a clever way to reuse assets. I put this particle system in the blueprint itself, disable auto activate, and then just set it to active once Rayman overlaps with the crystal. Okay, so let's try to go over how the point system is made. I stored the points on the player pawn. I don't know if that's something I should be doing, but it's the way it is, at least for now. So Rayman has a variable for points, for combo points, for the collection multiplier, that is the multiplier when Rayman collects more than five objects in combo mode, and collection group. This one drives the timer, so if the collection group is zero, that means Rayman picked up something that gives you a two second combo timer, and if collection group is one, that means Rayman picked up something that gives him the six second combo timer. So when he defeats an enemy, that's when we set the collection group to one. Okay, so maybe let's start with what happens when we pick up the crystal. First we get, get Rayman's current points, and then we set his points by taking his current points and adding the point value of this crystal. So if this was the yellow crystal, we would add 10 points to his current value. And then we check if Rayman is in combo mode. So if this was the first crystal he picked up, or if he picked up this crystal while being already in combo mode. Let's imagine he was not in combo mode yet. So this is false. So what we do now is just call his combo mode function that we'll go over in a moment. If combo mode was already true, however, we get his collection multiplier, we get his current combo points, and add this point value to the current combo points to set his new combo points. And then we set his new collection multiplier by adding one to his collection multiplier. So his co collection multiplier maybe isn't actually his collection multiplier. I should change his name. This is just the amount of objects that he has collected while in combo mode. And this over here is what kind of turns the amount of objects he collected into an actual collection multiplier. Because I divide the amount of objects he picked up by five and then round it up to an integer. So for example, if he picked up eight objects, I divide it by five and running it through a ceiling gives me two, which is correct because I want the eighth object to count for double in the combo point meter. However, I see I didn't clamp this to be no more than five. I just figured, why stop at five? <laughs> if the player can get more, let him. I can always change this later. By the way, after I was done with the crystal, I converted this whole setup that we discussed into a blueprint function called add points that I can just drop into any blueprint. So I don't have to copy and paste that whole thing every time. Okay, so that that's how the crystal adds points to Rayman. Now let's check out the combo mode function. This function determines whether Rayman is currently in combo mode or not. So once the combo mode function fires, we set combo mode to true, and then we check in which collection group Rayman is at the moment. So if we should start the two second timer or the six second timer. These timelines just have a linear curve that goes from one to zero. Let's ignore the combo time percent for now. So I always make these timelines play from the start. So the timer resets where, whenever we pick up something or defeat an enemy. And also in update, if we look, if we follow around this squiggly line, the update of one combo timer stops the other combo timer. That way, if we picked up something that gives us a two second timer, we stop that six second timer and vice versa. And once one of these combo timers finishes, we set combo mode back to false. Then we add in all the combo points that we gathered during combo mode to our current point value, and then reset the combo points to zero and reset our collection multiplier back to one. I hope all this makes sense. And now if I print my point values on the left, you can see if I collect the crystal, I get 10. If I collect another one, I get 20. After two seconds, it changes to 30. So now I would like to add the UI for the points. And while we're at it, let's make a health bar. Okay, so here are the UI elements I made. I wanna first show them in action and then go over how they work. I think that makes it easier to see what's going on. So 
if I start collecting these crystals, we see the point counter does this animation where it jumps up and down while points are updating. Also, the last digit kind of seems like it's scrolling through the counter. And also, I made the combo, the combo counter that's below the main counter move smoothly. You know, when I was playing this game as a kid, I always thought that it was really lame how in the opening cutscene that combo counter moves smoothly, but when you play the actual game, it just jumps back and forth. So I guess it's entirely possible that in actuality, I started this whole project just so I can fix the combo counter. Okay, believe it or not, I made the UI elements actually also in ZBrush. I just can't draw for the life of me. So I first sculpted them and then kind of overpainted them in Photoshop. So here are the UI elements, my beautifully painted health bar and it counters, the combo counter and a point counter. And here they are in the UI. So a couple of things to note, I have the animation that plays whenever I'm gaining points. Every one of these zeros is a different text object, a separate one. So like the last one is called points 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. the next one 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. Also, I decided to make it six digits instead of five because I heard that in the original, in one of the levels, you are able to get actually max points. It kind of caps out. So I figured why not increase that ceiling? Yeah, and the combo counter is behind the main counter. So now let's move into the graph. Okay, I do this whole thing in the tick. Let's ignore these nodes for now because they handle the health bar and move on to the point system. So we get Rayman's current points and we get his current combo points as well as we get this elusive combo time percent I was talking about earlier. So this is what I use to make the combo counter hide back behind the main counter smoothly. It's set here in the combo mode function that we checked out earlier. And it basically gets a value between zero and one depending on where we are on the timer at the moment. So like you remember, the timer starts at one and stops at zero. So if we're just starting the combo, then combo time percent will be one. And once we end the combo, the combo time percent will be zero. So now this UI element has its own current points and current combo points variables. And the idea is to compare them with Rayman's current point value. So let's say this UI current point value is 50 and so is Rayman's, but Rayman takes damage so he loses one point. Then current points will be larger than Rayman's current points that we're comparing it with. So we will move to this flow pin over here. So we will subtract one from our current points. That way in the next frame, when we compare the UI's current point value and Rayman's current point values, they will be equal and we can essentially do nothing. Now let's say they both have 50 points again, but Raymond grabs a yellow crystal. So suddenly he has 10 more points than the point counter. Then what we do, we add one point to the point counter this frame. So now next frame, the point counter will be only nine points behind Rayman. And we do this every frame until we reach Rayman's actual point value. And I hope you can imagine how this handles that animation of the counter kind of scrolling through the points until it hits Rayman's point value. Now for this kind of illusion that the points are scrolling on the counter, what I just do is whenever we change the last digit, I randomize the position of that digit in the y-axis in a set range. So it kind of looks like it's scrolling, but it's actually just jumping between different positions. That's what, why once this UI's current point value is equal to Rayman's current point value, I set this last digit's position back to its starting position so it doesn't stay somewhere in that random location. Then there's this animation that I want to be played while we're gaining points. And that's just done over here. Use the play animation node, except I have this branch over here to check if the animation is already playing so it doesn't revert back to the first frame every frame. And also if we look at the flow for when the point values are equal to each other, that's when we stop this animation. And then this over here does the exact same thing, but for the combo point counter. So there's no reason to go over this one. The only difference is that I have the 
combo point counters starting position and its position where I want it to be when we're in combo mode. And I lerp between those two positions using the combo time percent so that we have that smooth movement where it hides behind the point counter. Now, the only thing that hasn't been said is how I convert this point value into single digits. So the UI element knows that, for example, if we have, let's say 125 points, that this one, sh this number should be five, this number should be two, and this number should be one. So for that, I have these functions that are attached to every one of those numbers. Like for example, the last digit, what it does, it takes the current point value, it divides it by 10, and then, and then displays the remainder of that division. So if we imagine, for example, 123 points, we divide it by 10 and we get 12 and remainder three. And then similarly, let's say for the second to last digit. So if we try the same example here of 123 again, we divide 123 by 10, which gives us 12.3. We use a floor and that gives us 12. And then if we divide 12 by 10 again, we get one and remainder two. And two is the second to last digit of 123. Every other digit on the point counter is the exact same, except I just have to increase the number with which I divide it. So the third to last has to be divided by 100. The fourth to last has to be divided by 1000 and so on. And that's it for the whole point system. While we're on the topic of UI, we can quickly go over the health bar. So I have this progress bar element, which uses some kind of percentage to decide how much of it should be displayed. And if we go to our percentage function, it gets the player's max health. And then I have this health progress variable that's essentially the current health. So if I divide our current health by our max health, then we get a percentage value to scale the health bar by. So if we have five out of 10 health, the health bar will be filled 50%. The reason I have this health progress instead of just current health is I didn't want the health bar to snap to the health percentage. I wanted some kind of smooth transition. So I needed something to feed into the lerp. So every frame I lerp from this health progress value to the current health. And that way, if I get hit by an enemy, the transition on the health bar is smooth. Now there's the on-screen numbers that pop in whenever Rayman gets points. For this, I took the original texture and made a particle system. So this is the material, doesn't do much. It just takes in the particle alpha to, so the numbers fade out instead of disappear. And now here in the particle system, I have this user variable that I want to feed into the particle system. And what this does is, is if the point value is three, then this particle will spawn. If it's four, then this one. If it's five, then this, and so on. And to do this, you need to use the sub UV stuff in the particle system. So what this does is kind of divides the texture into smaller textures that you can kind of animate between. This is usually used for flipbook. However, instead of animating this, I just use the start frame offset to decide which image should be displayed. And I drive it through the point value variable. So if we look at this texture over here, this is frame 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In the particle system, it matches. So this system is spawned when comb whenever combo mode is fired because combo mode always fires whenever we pick up something. And here I have this variable added points for particle and I set it in my add points function that I mentioned earlier over here. So the way this works now is that it compares the point value of whatever I picked up with 30. And if it's less than 30, then I display the second frame of the particle system. So the 10 points, if it's equal to 30, then it displays the fourth frame. So 30 points. And if it's more than 30, then it displays the 10th frame, so 1,500 points. This is not a great system because it omits all the other point values. Just at the time, I didn't know better. <laughs> and I figured that these are the only three point values that I get during this level. So this is kind of a temporary solution. If I were to do this now, I would use a map instead. 
you know, actually let me fix this right now. This is a super simple fix. I can delete these. And I'll make a new local variable. I'll call it point map. I change it to an integer and of type map. And now I can set uh, all the elements here. So if I get 10 points, then I want to display the second frame of the particle system. If I get 30, I want to display four. If I get 100, I display six. 250 is eight. And 1,500 is 10. And now I get this point map. And use a find. And just plug in my point value. So if I get 10 points from something, then it finds that for 10 points, it needs to give me the second frame so I can plug this straight into the added points for particle. And that's basically the whole setup. So much simpler, much cleaner, and already handles all of the other frames. Okay, now let's check if this is still working after my changes. Okay, 10 points and 30. Awesome. So the last thing I want to do before ending this video is updating the crab and the uh, gnomes to give the player points when they get destroyed. So let's start with the crab. Since I made that blueprint function, it's as easy as just typing in add points and dropping it in. I set the point value to the crab's point value and the collection group to one. So the combo timer lasts for six seconds. And now for the gnome, I also just add the add points function with 10 points and a collection group of zero. And one more thing that needs to be done here is to spawn the yellow crystal whenever this gnome gets destroyed, since that's the behavior that we had in the original game. Okay, so the gnome gets destroyed, gives me points, spawns the crystal, awesome. And now the crab, we charge the fist, hit the crab, and we see the combo timer giving us much more time. Awesome. Grab the crystals for good luck. So in today's episode, I would like to put Glowbox in a barrel. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what I got to do here. So when I run up to the barrel, it seems to run away not too far. Of course, it starts running the other way. If I run from the back, it jumps above the gaps and the door blocks it. And that's pretty much it. So I kind of had two different ideas of how to approach this. One of them was going the AI route. So making this barrel some kind of AI controlled character. And the other one was to make a predetermined path using a curve and just have the barrel follow the path when Raymond gets too close. I decided to go for the second option because for one, I'd have to learn how to make AI and that kind of seems like a big endeavor just for this little barrel that just runs away from Rayman. So the second reason is that I was afraid that making an AI wouldn't be as foolproof as just having it use kind of simple math to run away from Rayman. Okay, I made that sound like there's a third reason, but it's just these two reasons actually. <laughs> okay, but as per usual, let's start with making a 3D model. I made a dedicated texture for the plum drawing. In Blender, I made a skeleton for the barrel that uses one bone. This is the animation when it's standing still and being terrified. This is the run animation. And also a jumping animation. It looks a little weird because I just want the animation to rotate the barrel and not actually lift it up. Because I'm going to make the jump in the path itself for the barrel. By the way, this low risk model is not some kind of retopology I've done. It's just a proxy model so Blender doesn't lag when playing these animations. In Unreal, I'm still using Nanite for this even though it's parented to a skeleton. I'm allowed to do this because I'm not exporting this as a skeletal mesh. I'm just parenting the static mesh to this bone. I do this for all the models that don't need deformation like the turtle shell. To do this, in the blueprint, you just take the static mesh and make it a child of the skeletal mesh and then you can attach it to whatever bone you need to over here. Now, before we go into making the barrel's logic, let's quickly deal with making this button close the door. 
All right, so here I am at the door's blueprint. The boulder is a separate mesh, and at this moment is at negative 370. If it's at zero, then it's blocking. So in the event graph, I made this custom block event that when it's called, I use a timeline that lasts for 0.8 seconds. So that's how long the door is going to be closing. And during this timeline, the door is lurping from that hidden position to the blocking position by feeding this value to the set relative location node. I keep it closed for nine seconds. Although this is something that I could make a variable to be controlled in the blueprint. I just didn't see a reason to do that because this is the only door like this in the whole game. Anyway, so after nine seconds, I have another timeline that reverses the effect of the first timeline. So we lurp from the blocking location back to the hidden location. And that's it for the door. Now for the button. Here's the model. I also added the box collider for Rayman to overlap with. And once Rayman overlaps with this collider, I set this collider's position somewhere below the button so Rayman can't collide with it again. Although now that I think about it, it'd probably be safer and simpler to just disable the collision. And then I call the block event on the Globox barrel blocker. So this one over here that I was discussing a moment ago. In order to connect this button to that door, I make the Globox barrel blocker a public variable on the button. And then in the scene, if I choose this button, I have Globox Barrel Blocker as a variable that I can set in the editor. And then I just set the one from the scene that I want to control. I have only one, so there's only one to choose from. So now the button knows that I want to call this specific door's block event. And then what's left is the kind of graphical side of things. So making this button move smoothly down and then back up again. And I did this pretty much the same way as I did the door movement. So using a timeline and lurping between two positions. Then after a delay, I revert it, as well as reverting the box collision back to its starting position. This one doesn't need a lerp though. Although one, one issue I see here right now is I reset the box collision's location before the button gets to reset its position, which is a minor bug, but, but the fix is just too easy to ignore. All I really need to do is reset the box collision's location after the button animation finishes playing. All right, let's get back to the barrel. Okay, so here I made a track for Globox. It's a loop with these jumps over here. And then there are these boxes over here on his track also. And what I make them do is whenever the barrel overlaps with them and Rayman is no longer in range, that's when he stops. So instead of making the barrel stop whenever Rayman is not in range, I kind of make him run to, towards some kind of set point because otherwise I run the risk that Globox stops in midair. And this way I have some kind of control over where his stopping points are. Okay, so here we are in the barrel blueprint now. This large sphere collision over here is for the barrel to know that Rayman is too close and it's time to start running. So once Rayman overlaps with this collision, that's when the running starts. Okay, let's take a look at the event graph. Okay, so here's the logic for moving along this spline and it starts kind of over here with this branch. So in the branch, we feed in whether Rayman has overlapped with that large sphere collision. And if that is true, first what we have to do is decide which way the barrel has to start running. So if Rayman's coming from the front or from the back, I put the nodes for that in this macro over here to have a little less nodes on the screen. So it's just easier for me to read. Anyway, if we go into this macro, what it does, it checks the dot product between the vector created by subtracting the player's location from the barrel's location and the barrel's forward vector. And now by just checking whether the dot product is larger than zero or not, I know whether Rayman is behind the barrel or not. Anyway, once we know if Rayman is behind the barrel or in front, then I set the direction to one or minus one. And now using the direction and the barrel speed variable, I can set the current speed and increase or decrease the distance along the spline using my current speed. If you're wondering where this cable is traveling to, it's going to the delta seconds. So the barrel movement is frame independent. Okay, so I'm getting the distance along the spline and I'm setting the barrel's location. Basically, it's the same logic that we had when making the butterflies move along the spline, except here the direction sometimes changes. And to set this actor's location, I enable the sweep because I want the barrel to detect whenever it hits the barrel blocker 
you know, the door we were talking about before. This is kind of where we have to move a little bit back. And maybe I'll move these cables a little bit so it's easier to see what's going on. I feed this sweep hit result into a branch. So whenever the barrel hits something, all this movement stuff doesn't happen. So it stops. I also have this branch over here that takes in the sweep hit result to set the current speed to zero. So actually this is what makes it stop. And then this branch over here is what make it not unstop. <laughs> However, I, I think that this is a little dumb. And instead of doing this over here, I could just set the current speed here in this branch. Let me check if this is working. Yeah, the barrel stops. Okay, anyway. I also set the barrel's rotation so it always faces the direction it's going, the same way as it was for the butterflies. And once again, just like with the butterflies, I need these nodes over here to set the distance back to zero once distance is larger than the spline length, so the barrel loops around the spline. So that's the barrel's movement along the spline working. But now, I need some kind of way for the barrel to know when it's jumping, so it plays the jump animation. As you can see, when it's never jumping, it's not shaking or walking. I hope you can see what's happening. And here's how I figured it out. Can you see these points on the spline over here? The way I laid them out isn't really random, it's pretty specific. So these points have all have numbers. Like this one is one, this one will be two, this one will be number three and four and so on. So now what I do is I find that they're called, those points are called input keys, by the way. And I find the closest input key to the barrel's location. So let me kind of visualize this for you. On the left over here, I'm printing the current closest input key. And as you can see, this is a float value. So while the barrel's on the ground, the closest input key is always some kind of even number with some kind of remainder. So like 2.4. And when the barrel's in the air, it's an odd number with some kind of remainder, like 3.5. So going back to our blueprint, we can see that what I do is I divide the closest input key by two and check if the remainder is larger or equal than one. Because if the barrel's on the ground and we have this even number with a remainder, like the 2.4, then the remainder will be just 0.4, so less than one. And that means that the barrel is not jumping currently. However, if the barrel's in the air, so we have this 3.5 that we took, for example, then the remainder of this division will be 1.5, so more than one. Therefore, we can tell the animation blueprint that the barrel should be jumping right now. And this is what we do. Depending on this check of jumping, we set jumping to true or false. Of course, using a branch here is kind of redundant. You can delete this and just plug it this right over here. Yeah, sorry. If I'm remembering correctly, all these barrel related blueprints were among the first blueprints I created for this project, so very early on in my learning process. And in the animation state machine for the barrel, I use the is jumping variable for the transition from idle or walking. Also, while we're in the animation blueprint, I'll just add that to check if the barrel should be in the idle or walking animation, I just check its current speed. I plug in this absolute node because when Rayman causes the barrel to run the other direction, the speed value is in the negatives. Okay, but this is also needlessly complex. I could just use a not equal. Boom. And lastly, there are the boxes that are supposed to stop the barrel. Those simply just set the barrel's speed to zero whenever the barrel overlaps them. For the barrel's damage response, there's no real reason to do this this video because when the barrel gets destroyed, it should spawn a cutscene and glow box, which at this point in time I didn't have yet. 
so I'll just leave this for a future devlog episode where I go over the cutscenes. Now the last thing to cover about this exterior part of the level before I start talking about the inside of the fairy council in the next devlog episode are these health orbs. So let's start with the particle system. It has a lot of layers because every one of those spinning circles is two layers. One for the circle and one for the trail. And also the middle is made out of two layers. One is this kind of erratic core, maybe let's call it. And the other one is this kind of afterglow. The material for the core looks something like this, a high contrast cloud texture. And I offset the UVs with a crystal texture that's animated using a panner. The cloud noise is animated as well. And then I use a sphere mask for the opacity. So the shape is a circle. The rest of the pieces use pretty standard materials. I made a custom one for the ribbon, but it's very simple. It's just this trail made by combining two simple gradient textures. Those trails rotating around the middle are just using the rotate around point node. However, the middle part is animated using scale sprite size. And I scale it using a waveform, the compounds sine cosine waveform. Every one of them give cool different effects, but I somehow just like this one the most. Same for the glow. Along with this particle system, I made a particle system for when Rayman collects a health orb. So it kind of implodes and dies out. And then another particle system that spawns at Rayman's location when he picks up the health orb. I kind of wanted this to look as if the health orb essence was kind of going into Rayman. So if my health isn't full, once I pick him up, this happens. And just like in the original game, once my health is actually full, then they just kind of hop and ignore me. Okay, so let's check out the blueprint. So they're made of a collision, the particle system, and a point light. And once Rayman overlaps with them, we get Rayman's current health and check if it's equal to his max health. Let's say they are equal, then I use a timeline to make the health orb jump up and down. So pretty much the same as how I made the door close before. However, if Rayman's health isn't full, I add the health orb's health variable to Rayman's health and set his new current health. Spawn in that health orb death particle. I also have a heal event on the player that gets called. All this event does is play the healing sound and spawn that other particle system that I was showing attached to Rayman's location. So basically it just handles the visual side of things. And then I destroy the health orb. There's one other small thing I did with the health orbs. If you look closely, the light underneath the health orb kind of flickers. It might be a little hard to notice. I wanted it to feel like this flickering of the core changes the light intensity. So to do this, in event tick, I oscillate the light's intensity using a sine function. So I get the game time in seconds and multiply them by 10, so the flickering is a little faster. I also plug in an absolute node because I don't want the sine function values to be negative. And then I remap the sine function values to be from 0.66 to 1 instead of 0 to 1. That's because otherwise the light would be vanishing completely whenever the sine function would be at 0. And that just wouldn't look correct because it's not like the health orbs are disappearing when they're pulsating. Welcome to the 13th episode of my devlog series that happens to come out on Friday the 13th. Spooky. Coming into this area, there were two things that I was sure about really. One is that I wanted to have this nice shadow on the floor coming from the glass ceiling. And the other one was changing the wall texture a little bit. Because honestly, I'm really not a fan of it. It's somehow very noisy and chaotic. It just, I don't know, to me it kind of lacks readability. It might be just my opinion, but, you know, my opinion usually gets all the votes around here. Let's run through this area so we're all on the same page about what I'm trying to make here. There are some of these critters that I actually don't have still up to this day. 
It's a button platform. Here the piggy banks get introduced. Which I need to destroy in order to progress. And there's this area with some more glass windows. And there's another platform. Teaching you about the curved punches. And a cutscene. All right. Since this was the first interior area that I've made for this project, uh, I had to make a lot of new assets, so as per usual, let's go rapid fire through some models. So here's the map geometry. And the corridor leading to this room. For the wall texture, I first sculpted it in ZBrush. As you can see, it's a little simpler than the original one, but still similar, I would say. I also wanted it to resemble, in some way, the exterior shell of the Fairy Council Tower. I feel like this way it reinforces the idea that you are inside of that tower. And here's the texture baked onto a plane and painted in Substance Painter. This environment is also where I sculpted and painted this project's first trim sheet texture. A trim sheet texture is kind of similar to a texture atlas where you have different smaller textures packed into one which you can use to kind of quickly build models that seem more complex than they actually are. And just like that, I have textures on my level geometry. This is looking incredibly empty, so let's get on with the rest of the models. Let's start off with these glowing pillars. I'm really liking the patterns the shadows are making on the walls from those pillars. We also have the button platform. The door. I'm having a hard time finding the ZBrush file for this one, so straight to Unreal. There's also this pillar structure over here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> mystery solved. So here's the door model actually. These piggy bank archways. This one has two versions, one that's open and one that's closed. I gave these crystals some glow as well as made it look like there's something moving inside. So while I'm at it, let me quickly talk about the shader because it uses a node that I haven't used before in this project and that's the bump offset node. This node basically gives the illusion of depth as I use this bump offset with this noise texture that's panning around the crystal, which you can see on the sphere on the left. Yeah, so with this node, it looks like this noise pattern is somewhere deep inside the crystal. If I disable it, this kind of lose this effect. This floor model was actually also sculpted which you can tell by all the crack detail. Then we have these square platforms. There are a lot of glass surfaces in this interior, so I'll talk about the shader in a moment once I finish going through the models. The second button platform. This glass ceiling or floor, depending on how you're looking at it. I have these stairs. Sculpting in stairs is really not a great approach. Stairs come in too many different shapes and sizes to sculpt them all by hand. 
It's just that at the time I didn't have a better idea, so I decided to sculpt them anyway and call it a day. Mind you, this is still back before anyone saw this project, so I was keeping in mind the possibility that no one would care once I uploaded the gameplay video onto YouTube and I would just move on to different things. However, I can assure you that this is the last set of stairs that I sculpted because nowadays I have a different approach, but I'll keep a little bit of mystery and not talk about how I make stairs in this video yet. Anyway, let's get back to the models. We got this bridge over here. This bridge over here. Then the glass windows and the glass ceiling. I can't find the models for these again. Maybe one day I'll stumble across them accidentally just like with the door. I'll be the first to admit that I don't really like how the glass looks on these. I'll probably redo this in the future. Although I can't say the same for the ceiling. I really like this heart pattern that I made and how it glows. What's really bugging me right now is how flat the wall texture looks. You can clearly see it's just a texture. It doesn't really hold the same quality as the other sculpted models because of how flat it is. Wait, who's that? Oh, hello Nanite Desolation. Tessellation basically dynamically subdivides your mesh in order to create more detail. If we look at the wireframe of this wall that I have over here, you can see that the geometry is very basic. It's very low poly. But then if I enable Nanite Tessellation, it creates all the polygons required to hold all of this detail. So this is a feature introduced in Unreal Engine 5.2. I'm not going to go over how to enable this because it's a little different depending on if you're using Unreal 5.2, 5.3 or 5.4. But if this is something you want to try out, it's pretty easy to find a tutorial on how to enable it for the version of your choosing anywhere on YouTube. I'm just going to jump right into what matters and that's the height map that I created and how it's connected in the shader graph. So here's the height map I baked out in Marmoset Toolbag. It's just a black and white texture where all the darker areas will be pushed inward into the mesh and all the brighter areas will get pushed outward. A little tip I can give, I usually find that blurring the height map sometimes gives better results near areas where there's a big change in color because any sharp changes can give pretty jagged edges on your mesh in those areas. So now for the shader, honestly all you can do is just connect the height map right into this displacement channel and that would be enough. But I wanted to have a little more control, so I created all of these nodes over here to be able to change the, the tiling of the texture, the offset, and the rotation. As well as I have this displacement strength over here, a parameter that allows me to dial in the strength of the mesh displacement. If you're using Unreal Engine 5.4, then honestly, you don't really need this displacement strength because you can just change the displacement on the material instance over here, the magnitude. However, this doesn't really work in Unreal Engine 5.3, which is the version I'm using. So that's why I have this little node over here. Now for the windows, the metal frame comes from a texture that I created, this one over here. Just like all the other ones, this also came from a ZBrush sculpt. I wanted these windows to be actually transparent instead of how they were in the original. So to make this glass material, I followed this tutorial right over here. Although if I'm remembering correctly, the gist of it was that once you set your blend mode to translucent, you need to set your lighting mode to surface translucency volume or surface forward shading. These are pretty expensive, but it's just the way I have it, at least for now. Okay, so the next step was to throw around some of the assets that I've already created around the room, just to make it look a little more, I don't know, 
It just looks better. It feels less empty. Also using some of the foliage that I've created on the walls. By the way, all those smaller pebbles were laid out using the physical layout tool. It's a free Unreal Engine plugin. That's really cool. It kind of allows you to throw down assets using physics. So it takes much less time and looks pretty natural. One thing to note though, it is pretty buggy and often crashes Unreal Engine 5. However, William Fauschner has a great tutorial on how to use this tool because he also goes into how to avoid those crashes and kind of work around this tool to have a better experience using it. Okay, I'd like to talk about the lighting right now a little bit. So I wanted to have this dark gloomy feel in this room, kind of like it was back in the original. Um, I changed the direction of the directional light to make it go through the windows like this. I also increased the density of the fog. So you have these god rays coming through the windows. I also can't change the color of the light to a more green tone. I just like this combo of this kind of violet blue with the green. I also changed the horizon color of the sky sphere to a green color. So it matches the light source. Outside behind the windows, I throw around some stuff <laughs> just to make it look like there's some kind of world behind this, these windows. I also put some fog cards from the William Fauschner Easy Fog asset, the same one I used when discussing uh, making the exterior area. And then the as a bit of a cherry on the top, I put two fog cards here underneath this window. It's very subtle, but I think it adds a lot. For the piggy bank room, I didn't deviate much from the original. I just made it be this kind of magical, calming blue color. Now this next room, I went for more of an orange color because of the giant orange window, window on the top. But... Honestly, I'm not sure if I'm entirely happy with the lighting in this room. I think it maybe feels a little flat or could, or could just do with some more contrast. So it's very possible that in the future I will tweak it a little bit to maybe make the orange light a little weaker or anything else. Or I don't know, I'll try some stuff and see. Okay, why don't we take a closer look at the piggy banks now? Piggy banks in Rayman have these two properties. One is where you have to charge your fists to a certain amount to destroy them. Hitting them with your regular fist won't damage them at all. And the second one is that when you destroy them, they usually spawn something for you like crystals or health orbs. So let's go have a look at the blueprint where I created this functionality. So once the piggy bank gets hit by something, we check if the damage is above a certain threshold. Let's say that it wasn't because the fall spin is a little simpler. So let's start with it. All that happens here is we play a hit sound and a timeline makes the piggy bank just jump a little bit like it was in the original. But then if we met this minimal damage threshold, we of course add the points because you get points for destroying the piggy bank. And then here's all the logic that spawns the contents of the piggy bank. So first of all, I have this number of rewards variable over here that can be changed on the instance. So I can make a piggy bank spawn any amount of rewards that I want. So I plug in the number of rewards into a for loop. So the proper amount of rewards gets spawned. And in the loop body, we basically spawn an actor. The actor we spawn is a variable called piggy contents. And this is also a variable I can change on the piggy bank instance. So I can make a piggy bank spawn pretty much any actor that I want. Like I could make a piggy bank spawn, I don't know, 10 enemies, which would be pretty funny. So I spawn the actor at the location of the piggy bank. And then I rotate the spawned actor a set amount. So later on, once the reward is spawned, I will just move the reward in relation to its forward vector. I'll just illustrate how this works to make it clearer. 
let's say the number of rewards is 3. So we divide 360 by 3, which gives us 120. And then we multiply this by the index of the loop iteration. So the first index is 0, so 120 times 0 is 0. So the first actor will spawn with a zeroed out rotation. Now the second one will spawn with a rotation of 120. And the third one will spawn with a rotation of 240. Now if I start moving each one of these rewards in relation to its own forward vector, they will flare out nicely in a circle. Now to create this behavior in code, first I create an array of the spawned actors, and then once the loop body is completed, well first I spawn a destroy piggy bank particle system, but that's not important right now. I hide the piggy bank and disable its collision, and then I use a timeline to move each one of these spawned actors, first of all in relation to its forward vector, and then also in the z-axis I move it up and down to make it look like it jumps out. Then once this timeline is finished, I can destroy the piggy bank actor. Okay, let's see this in action. I'm charging my fist. The piggy bank that gets destroyed and we see the crystals jumping out each in its own direction. Just to see this is all working, let's say I have eight number of rewards. We'll spawn in a health orb instead. And destroying the piggy bank spawns eight health orbs laid out nice in a circle. And here's a quick peek at the piggy bank destroy particle effect. It's just a cloud of smoke and various parts of the piggy bank spawning. I did add a collision node which causes the various pieces not to fall through the floor. Okay, cool. So the final thing I haven't talked about yet are these platforms. Let's start with the button blueprint. So the button itself doesn't really do anything. The only logic that it has is that whenever it receives damage, it changes the emissive property of its material in order for it to glow. And then I have this custom button off event, which whenever it gets fired, it just causes the button to stop glowing. Oh, and by the way, at this point I did learn about material dynamic instances, so I didn't have to come up with a weird workaround that would prevent all the buttons lighting up that share the same material whenever the, one of them is hit. Kind of like I had with the bouncy mats in one of my previous videos. Here I just create a dynamic material instance and assign it to this button in begin play. So now we have the platform. Note that I have this button variable that's instance editable. So I can connect any button from the level to this platform. Pretty much the same way how it was done with the pressure pad and the glowbox blocker in the previous episode. And now in the event graph, first of all we have the on take any damage for the button event, which fires whenever the button that's connected to this platform receives damage. So whenever it receives damage, this timeline fires, which for the duration of the timeline moves the platform upwards. I also have this branch over here that kind of works like a clamp limiting how high the platform can go, so you can't move up indefinitely. Anyway, whenever this timeline finishes, then I call the button's button off function, so it stops glowing and the player knows it's time to hit it again. And then event tick pushes the platform downward every frame, as long as the button isn't in its on state, while also limiting its lowest position to its starting position, so the platform never ends up lower than it started. And then finally, to make the button blueprint move up with the platform itself, even though they're not part of the same blueprint, I parent the button to the platform here in the actual level. Now this second platform over here has the exact same code as the first one to move it upwards. Um, the only difference is, is that the button is not actually parented directly to this platform. It's parented to a platform rotator that's then parented to the platform. What this rotator does is it rotates whenever the button receives damage, forcing the player to hit it from the other side. So this is basically its own separate model. The way I set this up is that whenever the connected button receives damage, this timeline gets played in order to animate the mesh's rotation. However, if the button gets hit again, I need this timeline to reverse the rotation so the mesh goes back to its starting rotation. This is where this reverse boolean comes in. Whenever this timeline finishes, the reverse boolean gets flipped, so if it was true it becomes false and if it was false it becomes true. And then this boolean decides here 
at the branch whether the timeline should play normally or it should be reversed. Although nowadays, I actually know of a node that's called flip-flop, which I didn't know at the time. So we can simplify this code by deleting all of this. Connecting this to the flip-flop. A goes to play and B goes to reverse. So basically this flip-flop node alternates between option A and B. If the previous option was A, then the next one will be B. If previously it was B, then the next one will be A. I feel like I went pretty quickly through these blueprints, but if you have been following the series, then you've seen similar code in my videos. So I just didn't want to bore you by repeating myself too much. Anyhow, since this was another environment breakdown, why don't we finish this episode with another summary? So counting the level geometry as one model, for this area I made 17 new models, giving us 110 in total. I've created three new master materials, one for the displacement wall shader, one for the glass, and one for the crystals at the piggy bank room. So altogether that's 16. For texture sets, this time we don't have any dedicated texture sets, but we have overall three new ones. One for the wall, one for the window frame, and one for the trim sheet. So overall we have 21 texture sets right now. And then there's this one new particle system when the piggy bank gets destroyed. So that's 13 particle systems in total. Hi, welcome to the final episode of what I like to call season one of my devlog series. Today I want to take a closer look at the cast of characters I've created so far for the project, as well as the in-game cutscenes. Why don't we start off with taking a closer look at the cast of characters. First up we got Rayman. As you can tell, I didn't really change anything here. It's just that to me the Rayman 3 design is pretty much perfect, so I wanted to leave him pretty much unchanged. Then we have our dear Glowbox, one of my favorite characters in the series. As you can see, I left the proportions completely unchanged again. I just really love the character design in Rayman 3. My god, Murphy's T-pose is slightly nightmare inducing. Fun fact, initially I wanted Murphy's teeth to be a texture that doesn't move when he speaks just like the original, but honestly it just looked lower quality than the rest of the game. It looked like it was unfinished. I actually have an unlisted video where Murphy still has non-moving teeth that I made just to share between my friends. Although the video quality is pretty abysmal. Okay, then there's the hoodmonger rocking a ninja turtle headband. I did give him a slightly longer hat. And then there's his super advanced firearm. And some textures. And this is my friend Slapdash. His weapon of mass destruction. And the textures. I really like how this one came out. For one of the cutscenes, I had to remake the hoodlum drop shit. It's a little hard to showcase because it's kind of an amalgamation of different old and new assets. But you get the overall idea, hopefully. The first challenge I encountered when working on the cutscenes was with the rigs themselves. Like I said in a previous episode, I used the original animations for the characters. But the thing is, the rigs on which those animations are don't have proper bone hierarchy. None of them are parented to each other. So if I, for example, rotate the uh, forearm here, as you can see, the hand isn't moving because it's not parented to the forearm bone. And the problem with this is that it's pretty much impossible to 
make your own custom animations with, with a rig like this one. So I had to come up with a way to make a proper rig and transfer all the original animations to that proper rig so that both the original animations and my custom animations can be used on the characters in game. So the way I did this was first duplicating all the bones in the rig without moving them. Then I transferred all the characters weight paints to the duplicated bones. So for example, now the weight painting that was attached to the original hand bone would be attached to the duplicated hand bone. And then I made a proper hierarchy out of the duplicated bones. So that would be enough to create my own custom animations and move the character in a more manageable manner. But none of the original animations are on the new bones right now. So to kind of transfer them, what I do is for every of the duplicated bones, I have a copy transforms constraint. What this constraint does is it overrides this bone's location to its target location. And the target I set for every one of these duplicated bones is the corresponding original bone that was that this bone was duplicated from. So now as long as these constraints are active, the duplicated bones are moving the same way the original bones are moving, which makes it so that when I export all these animations to Unreal Engine, these animations are going to be set on the proper rig and not the original rig. And if I want to make my own custom animations, I just have to disable all of these constraints and just go ahead and start animating. Side note, none of the original bones get imported into Unreal Engine because all of the original bones have the deform disabled. And then when I export the FBX file on the armature settings, I have only deform bones set to true. Now the next thing to tackle before actually animating the characters was giving them the option to MO and talk because the original rigs don't give you much fidelity in regards to facial animations. In CG, there are two main approaches for this, at least two that I know of. One is creating a bone-driven facial rig, so just adding in more bones to the rig and animating the characters the same way kind of how you animate the rest of the body. And the second solution is by creating a set of expressions and animating the character by blending between different expressions. I wouldn't say that one approach is better than the other. It's more just of a case of personal preference. I myself prefer creating the facial expressions and blending between them. However, this also depends heavily on the character that you're making. Even though I prefer making expressions, for Glowbox I created a bone-driven facial rig because it just made much more sense for this character in my opinion. Now why don't we take a look at how I go about creating those expressions for the characters. Let's take Murphy for example. So I imported the mesh into ZBrush. This is not the original sculpt, this is the retopologized model that's used in-game. And now ZBrush has this layer system where I can record changes I made to the mesh through these layers. Like for example, if I make a new layer now and do some kind of change like that, I can now blend between the unchanged version and my change. What's cool about this is that I also can go to the negatives. So using this approach, I created these seven layers. We have the sad version, the worried one, blinking, <laughs> an O letter, a W letter, I'm doing something like this, and an M letter. You can kind of see how by blending between a couple different variations of these shapes, I can create some facial animations. I also got one expression for slapdash, although it's kind of two expressions if I go the other way. And then I got two for the hoodmonger. By mixing these two together, I can make him laugh. So I'm getting closer to creating some cutscenes, but I'm still not quite there yet. I still need to get my bearings on the Unreal Engine sequencer because at that point, I still had no experience using it. Luckily, in the original game, there's this one cutscene that can be hardly called a cutscene. I don't even need to animate any characters for it because in the original ripped animations, I already have an animation for Murphy reading the manual. So this is where I decided to start. Okay, so here's the first cutscene I created. 
I hope you're ready for this one. This manual just blows my mind. <laughs> it explains the switch's trigger mechanisms. Duh! Police! Who's responsible for this garbage? I know, pretty amazing. Murphy isn't even in the frame here. But that's because this cutscene gets triggered once Murphy overlaps with this box over here. So that's why he's not in the cutscene in the preview. But in game, he would be there. So making the proper cutscene play once Murphy overlaps with that trigger box is very simple. You just call the play function on the proper cutscene. Then I have this boolean to make sure that the same cutscene doesn't get played twice. But this is again before I knew about the do once node. So nowadays I would delete all of this. And just use this node instead. One more thing to mention about the sequencer is that every sequence has its own blueprint where you can, you know, put in some logic. And this is where I do stuff like disabling the input on the player so you can't move while the cutscene is playing or where I set the UI opacity to zero. I'm not sure about this one, but I think that normally disabling and then enabling the input is enough if you're using the default character controller but since I made my own movement controller this wasn't enough because disabling the input doesn't zero out his movement velocity so he would run indefinitely so I had to make some additional booleans on my Rayman class. I made it so that when this boolean is true then his movement speed gets zeroed out or if he's charging his fist that also gets zeroed out. Now we better sit down for this one. I made the cutscene skippable by pressing the enter key. I know I also can't contain my tears of joy right now. Okay, so with that out of the way, it was time to make a proper cutscene. I decided to start with the one with, where Rayman regains his hands because it's very short. Um, I will say that I'm not much of an animator, but even for my standards, this one I think is pretty scuffed. Um, the movement for the characters, I think it's really stiff. But, well, I just decided to keep it as it is and try to do a better job next time because making these cutscenes is really time consuming, at least for me. And in my opinion, the next ones are much better than this first one. So my workflow for making these cutscene animations is to import a part of the map from Unreal Engine to Blender and import the original cutscenes audio file into Blender. And then I animate the characters around that audio file. As you can see, I do animate a camera in Blender too. Although this is just for some basic ideas. Later on in Unreal Engine, I redo the camera animations from scratch. The next animation I decided to tackle was the starting animation. This one I am much more happy with. Come on, I'm kidding. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? <laughs> Don't be so touchy. Here, check out what I found. The manual. It's all in here. If you read the story, you'll find your way out. You might find pretty interesting how you can see which expressions he's using to talk by seeing which letters grow. Because the larger the letter is, the more he's using the expression that corresponds to that letter. What a scaredy cat he is. He's probably hiding someplace. It's not going to be easy to get your hands on him. <laughs> and no pun intended. Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that every action wins you points. Let me demonstrate. Keep an eye on the counter. Whenever you score points, the indicator appears and you switch to combo mode. Of course, the characters don't move uh, when they're not on screen. <laughs> it wouldn't make much sense to animate them right now. Stops, combo mode stops. One last thing, points can buy you access to hidden levels, so try to score big. At this point, I knew I wanted the cutscenes to transition smoothly into gameplay when they end, just like a lot of modern games do it nowadays. But I somehow couldn't really find a proper tutorial on how to do this, so I had to figure my own way, which is probably completely backwards and inefficient, but. <laughs> In case anyone has the same problem, here is how I go about this. So first of all, as I scrub through the cutscene, you can see that the player ends up here where I want him to start. The default behavior for every sequence in Unreal Engine is that when it ends, it reverts all the changes back to its state from before the cutscene. So to make sure that the player actually stays here where he is right now when the cutscene ends, well, one approach could be through the blueprint editor just by making an event that overrides his position at the end because these actually get kept 
after the animation. But there's a lot more simpler way. If I go to the player's transform channel, so you know, his location, scale, and rotation. If I right click over here, when you go to the properties, there's actually this section called when finished, where you can choose whether after the cutscene is finished, I want to restore the state of this actor from before the cutscene, or I want to keep it. By default, it's I think it's set to restore state, but by changing it to the keep state, I make sure that the player will be over here once the cutscene ends. So now it's just a matter of blending the camera smoothly from the camera view to the player's view at the end of the cutscene. Now, this sounds simple, and it usually is in Unreal Engine. What you usually do is just use this set view target with blend node to blend the view from one view to another. But the issue here is that this camera cut tracks, which is very useful because it allows you to cut between different cameras. But the problem here is that it overrides the view target so that set view target with blend node I showed earlier doesn't do anything while the camera cuts track is active. The workaround I found is to mute this and then set the view target manually for every cut I have, which is as tedious as it sounds. Basically, every time I want the camera to cut, I need to add a custom event that switches the view camera. To be honest, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't really know why instead I didn't just use the camera cuts and then blend the view after the cutscene ends. I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but this sounds like a much simpler solution. <laughs> I'll try it next time when I'm working on a cutscene. And if it works, I guess I'll make a follow-up video to this one. So the next cutscene I tackled was the most complex one, as there's the most characters to animate and it's fairly long. But this is also the cutscene that I'm the most happy with. I find that scream really funny. I didn't animate him running through the door because I reused an original animation for that. I figured that was a good way to save some time. I really liked the idea I had with Murphy snatching the camera to start his monologue because I always found it pretty awkward how in the original cutscene there's all this action happening and suddenly for no particular reason we're forced to just look at Murphy spouting some nonsense. And what I think is really cool is that even though I made this cutscene, Every time I play the game, I get fooled anyway into thinking that the cutscene is ending before his monologue. So I usually press the forward key to start running just to get hit with the reality that Murphy is the one in control. And then there's this cutscene over here, the last one I made so far. Nothing much to say here. I think it's fine. Nothing special. I didn't even animate a camera for this one because it's so short. Thank you very much for watching. That covers almost everything I had to make to create that gameplay demo as seen in the video. It's hard to believe that I uploaded that video almost half a year ago now already. There were some things that I didn't cover, honestly, because those things just didn't really fit any of the topics that I had for the videos, so I had a hard time finding the right place to cover them. But none of those things are very significant, so I personally don't really see that as a big issue. Like I said in my previous video, at the moment I will be making less YouTube content because I want to focus on the game. If you want to learn more about my plans, you can go watch that video. I go into a little more detail about that. However, if there is anything you would like me to make a video on, I did open up a Discord server and there's a channel for video suggestions. So if I like your suggestion, then I might make a video on it. So thank you very much for watching, especially if you have been following the series from the very beginning. If that is the case, then that's insane. Thank you very much for that. I wish you all a very good day and hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.